call to order the Iowa City Council meeting on November 30th. It is 6 p.m. And I'm going to start with a roll call, please. Burgess? Here. Mims? Here. Sully? Here. Yeah. Taylor? Here. Teague? Here. Thomas? Here. Weiner? Here. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the City of Iowa City um, formal meeting, to those that are in the audience and the, for those that are listening through social media. I did want to take a moment to just acknowledge Edel Adams, who was a change agent in the com Sudanese community, who has <clears throat> always made it his priority to put other, others before himself. He passed away on Friday. And just wanted to talk a little bit about him. He held an MBA from Mount Mercy, as well as a law degree from Khartoum, Sudan, he was born and raised in Sudan, but his unique perspective came from the fact that he had children who had been born in the United States as well as Sudan. Through mentorship and advocacy, Adele gave the Sudanese community a voice at the table, not only in Iowa City, but more broadly across the nation. For example, Adele was a critical piece of the Obama campaign in Iowa as he advised the campaign on how to engage with the large Sudanese community in Iowa City. Outside of his work on the Human Rights Commission for the City of Iowa City, he spent time spearheading the Sudanese community's involvement with the Iowa City's taxi business. Adele was passionate about helping others and his involvement in the Sudanese community, and his six years on the Human Rights Commission showed just that. I ask that you join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. I'm going to move to item number two, which is proclamations. And it is 2A, Human Rights Day, and I'm going to ask that Councilor Burgess read this. Whereas Human Rights Day is observed every year on December 10th, the day the United Nations General Assembly adopted in 1948 the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UDHR. The UDHR is a milestone document which proclaims the inalienable rights that everyone is entitled to as a human being, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, language, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. And whereas 2021 theme is equality, reducing inequalities, advancing human rights. This year's Human Rights Day theme relates to equality and Article 1 of the UDHR. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The principles of equality and non-discrimination are at the heart of human rights. Equality is aligned with the 2030 Agenda and with the UN approach set out in the document Shared Framework on Leaving No One Behind, Equality and Non-Discrimination at the Heart of Sustainable Development. And whereas advancing equality and non-discrimination includes addressing and finding solutions for deep-rooted forms of discrimination that have affected the most vulnerable people in societies, including women and girls, indigenous peoples, people of African descent, LGBTI people, migrants, and people with disabilities, among others. And whereas equality, inclusion, and non-discrimination, in other words, a human rights-based approach to development, is the best way to reduce inequalities and resume our path towards realizing the 2030 Agenda. Rebuild better, fairer, greener. Now, therefore, on behalf of Mayor Bruce Teague of Iowa City, I do hereby proclaim December 10th, 2021 to be Human Rights Day in Iowa City and urge all persons to combat all forms of discrimination and to protect the human rights of all residents. And accepting this proclamation this evening is Jim Olson with the Johnson County United Nations Association.
Thank you. My name is Jim Olson. I'm the president of the Johnson County Chapter of the United Nations Association. I want to thank Mayor Teague for issuing this proclamation and thank the Council, the Human Rights Commission, uh, the City's Office of Equity and Human Rights, and all those in city government and throughout our community who work day in, day out to protect and uphold the rights of all residents of Iowa City. As the proclamation states, December 10th is Human Rights Day. It's the 73rd anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN General Assembly. It's an opportunity for us to reflect on the fact that human rights are under attack around the world. We must remain vigilant and active. And our idea of what constitutes human rights are continually evolving. In that vein, I'd like to invite all of you to participate in a Human Rights Day event on Friday, December 10th at noon, a virtual presentation hosted by the University of Iowa Center for Human Rights and our UNA chapter, uh, presented by Dr. Tom Farrer of the University of Denver on the topic, Is There a Right for People to Cross Borders in Search of a Better Life? So with that, again, I, I thank Mayor Teague and the Council for issuing this proclamation and declaring December 10th Human Rights Day in Iowa City. We are moving on to item number three, which is a special presentation. 3A is going to be COVID update from Johnson County Public Health, and that will we'll welcome Sam Jarvis. Good evening to the City Council, Sam Jarvis, Johnson County Public Health. Uh, certainly we'll cover probably what's on front of mind of most folks, and we've uh, all seen and uh, know that the public is aware of a new Greek letter, which is Omicron, uh, and certainly it's predominated the news in the past several days. and. Um, you know, well after the holidays. And so uh, at this point in time, uh, I do just want to reiterate uh, after we've spoken to our state and federal partners that at this moment, um, there's very, very little known about this new variant. And so uh, while yes, it's been listed as a very of concern by the World Health Organization, uh, we are still waiting to learn more about it, whether it's more trans transmissible, uh, whether or not we'll see more breakthrough cases with vaccine. So uh, at the moment, uh, certainly it is of note, it is concern, but uh, there is no need to, to cause panic or, or uh, much alarm at the moment. And a good reminder that we do have the, the knowledge and the tools to be able to continue to uh, lower transmission and make our daily life safer. Uh, so whether or not we, we learn more about this variant in the coming days or weeks, or whether it's identified in the, the U.S. or Iowa, uh, we do want to remind everyone that, again, we can continue to physically distance as best as possible. We can continue wearing masks. Vaccination is... Uh, one of the best tools uh, against uh, COVID-19. And certainly now uh, in the giving uh, the past couple of days, we've seen the CDC strongly encourage everyone 18 years and older uh, get their booster. Uh, so it's been a little bit more clear messaging from our federal partners on, on what that means for, for everyone. So again, we are encouraging everyone 18 years and older to get their booster. So if you've received Moderna or Pfizer, uh, it is six months after your second dose. Uh, if you've received Johnson & Johnson, it's two months after that. And so uh, we'll continue to share information on availability uh, with our partners uh, across our community at our hospitals and pharmacies. So uh, at the moment, we are uh, still seeing an increase in, in trend. I believe the last time we reported out uh, near the end of October, we started to see that increase. Uh, we were hoping to see that uh, trend downward uh, mid-October, but um, sadly, uh, we're not there yet. Uh, roughly over the past several uh, days we've had an average of about 80 cases we've seen some triple digit days uh, so it's it, it is concerning uh, and we're continuing to see transmission uh, in uh, vaccinated and unvaccinated households uh, one area of concern that i know that our disease prevention uh, team has, has noted that um, uh, our younger uh, age ranges who were not eligible to be vaccinated yet or maybe waiting to be vaccinated uh, would become ill, and then certainly parents uh, who are vaccinated were, were becoming ill after that. So um, 
the upside to that is those who are vaccinated certainly have uh, less severe illness, uh, which is good news. Uh, but again, a good reminder that um, we, we strongly uh, encourage everyone to get vaccinated as soon as possible. On a lighter note, uh, to date, we've allocated uh, roughly over uh, 12,000 pediatric vaccines for five to 11 year olds. So well over what our population is locally. So at the moment, the limiting factor is getting appointments. Uh, we know that there's been some frustration across the community, but uh, please be patient and please know that our hospital and pharmacy partners are doing everything they can to get those appointments scheduled uh, or to fill those appointments and to offer offsite clinics, which we've had several in the past weeks. Uh, we know that those clinics are, are now roughly approaching their, their second dose clinic uh, starting this week. So we've got several others uh, being planned for the end of this week and early next week as well too. So uh, overall, uh, the upside is that we are getting uh, five to 11 year olds vaccinated. So uh, that is, I believe most of our, our kind of updates and highlights. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Any sense of when data is going to come in for the under fives? Uh, no clue. We, we have asked the state health department uh, when that will be, and I believe they're still waiting on getting those improvements um, to their, the, the state's dashboard. But uh, from what our partners report, uh, we believe there's been roughly uh, at least 3,000 5 to 11 year olds vaccinated in our community. Uh, that was a report, uh, report we received about a week and a half ago. Uh, we know that from our partners at UHC, uh, Hy-Vee and Towncrest uh, and, and the VNA. Uh, that performed some off-site clinics uh, about a week ago. So we're making good progress. I mean, there, there is a, a high demand in our area, so uh, which we're happy to see. And, and um, your view on the, the, the current need for wearing a mask? Uh, we need to continue to do so. Uh, certainly right now, the CDC's guidance has not changed. So areas of substantial or high transmission need to continue to wear masks in indoor spaces. Um, so we're, we're hoping that folks continue to recognize that and remain vigilant. Uh, right now, I, I think where uh, we are seeing transmission occur is, is that lapse. You know, certainly we're all very tired of this and it's been very difficult. Uh, so it's just a, a reminder to stay vigilant uh, and keep up the good practices while we, we enter this uh, trend, upward, upward trend of cases. And then certainly to recognize that it, uh, we saw good results of flu season last year. We virtually saw very little cases of flu. So we know that uh, this is helpful for other respiratory viruses as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right, moving on to item number 3B, UCI Jingle Cross World Cup Cycle Cross Race. Welcome, Josh Schumberger. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, and I appreciate just a few minutes uh, in front of the council here tonight. As I've been customary, uh, I've, I'd like to come and just uh, give the council a little overview over the UCI World Cup event that's taken place now five times in Iowa City and been broadcast five times in Iowa City to uh, between 14 and 16 million people across Europe and the country uh, live from the Johnson County Fairgrounds. And this year was certainly uh, our most challenging of the five years because we had worked so hard to book that international event uh, on a bye weekend for Iowa football. And then they went and changed the schedule and we were up against homecom or, um, yeah, homecoming uh, game. So very challenging. Uh, with people and resources, but as always, uh, the city of Iowa City continues to step up and support alongside Johnson County to put on and host this tremendous event. Uh, there's a couple individuals in, in particular that always step up, and that's Brock with your Streets Division and Darian Nagel Gam, and of course, Jeff and his entire team. So just want to thank all of them. Uh, this event attracted just short of about 300 people from Europe, uh, and this was uh, our most popular and most uh, attracted event of all the five that we've had. And uh, that was evident in the women's race, where in the women's professional race, we had here in Iowa City for three or four days up until race day. And then on race day, we had nine of the top 10 ranked women in the world here in, uh, in Iowa City in Johnson County. And they come from all over the country, uh, Canada, and certainly all over Europe, where they have Sunday night cyclocross just like we have Sunday night football. And so that's why it's broadcast live all across Europe. So um, I'll be happy to answer any questions, but just want to say thank you. This brings in a tremendous amount of attention and exposure to the city of Iowa City. And certainly with all of the visitors, it brings 
uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in expenditures to local businesses, hotels, restaurants, and, uh, and retail establishments. So as customary, we always like to bring a little piece of the race to you so Jeff can hang it alongside the rest of the year's events. So this year we brought you a section of the start line uh, from the UCI World Cup that has Iowa City on it and was shown uh, all over the world. So thanks very much. Happy to answer any questions, but appreciate all the continued support of this, this significant event. So, so Josh, I, I have a lot of friends in Belgium and I recorded the Belgian national anthem being played for, for one of the winners and they couldn't believe it. Yeah, you know, we have to always make sure that when we play the national anthem, we have the exact national anthem. So we have about 40 of them queued up. And I'm always worried that the Netherlands is going to play for Belgium, but we got it right. So very good. It was a great event, well ran, and I, I think you all should be very proud of all the work as well as the experience that it brought to the community. Thanks very much, Mayor. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. We are on uh, the consent items, which is items four through nine. Can I get a consideration for adoption of the consent calendar as presented? So moved. moved. Second. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Mims. Would anyone from the public like to address any item? Moved by who? I would. Oh. Moved by Jeff. <laughs> second by <laughs> Mazi here. Sorry. All right. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I heard Weiner. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I made the motion it. and, Ma, and Mazi yes. seconded it. I'm sorry. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Salee. <laughs> okay. I must have said the wrong name. Yeah. Your name. Okay, great. All right. Would anyone from the public like to address a topic that is under the consent agenda? If so, please write your name at the desk over there in the corner and then uh, come to the podium and state your name and your address. Welcome. Uh, sir, sorry. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Nicholas Tyson. Um, I'm not gonna give you my address, I don't have to, so I'm not going to. Um, I wanna draw your attention to item 5A on the consent agenda because, so this is relevant to a discussion that you had during the work session. Several of you mentioned the fact that you weren't exactly clear what it was that the, the TRC wanted at certain times, like what they were doing. And it's interesting that you brought up at several points requests for things from them that they actually discussed at that very meeting. So I wanted to highlight the fact that it's in the minutes. And if you want to know what their timeline is for the extension, you could just you know read the minutes that you are in fact passing right now. And so that's, <laughs> and so as a more general comment on that fact, there is the basic problem that this council has had time and time again, where literally the, inf it's right there. It's literally right there. The information that you need from your commissions to make decisions that you should be making has already been given to you. And so 90%, most of the time, when commissions have problems, it's precisely because this council isn't actually doing its work. So I would strongly suggest that before you make grand pontificating statements about like, oh, we need this from the TRC, or oh, we need this from planning and zoning, that you could actually read the fucking minutes that they send to you. Thank you. Thank you, welcome. And we ask that people keep their comments to three minutes and the timer is over there. Welcome. Hello, Noah, not doxing myself. And now I, will, now I will read an email I sent to y'all uh, at the end of October that most of y'all ignored, which I'm not surprised. Anyways, okay. So here's me reading from the email. Now I will expand on the need for having Zoom call in public comment at meetings. This, no, is this I don't a, care. Oh, well, if this, Every is, single if person this is not have, a consent item. Well, are you going to have accessible meetings? If this is not a consent item, I don't care. Please be respectful uh, and wait no. until the next. No, ah, you don't get to tell me to be respectful when you are currently discriminating against disabled people by not having accessible Noah, meetings. Do not give me any less than about respect or not respect when you are currently discriminating Noah, repeatedly about not having accessible meetings. Make this is not a consent item. I will not item. speak during this. Make your meeting successful then. It is not a consent item. I don't care. You are currently being extremely ableist by not having hybrid meetings. So I'm going to continue to speak. You are currently dis you, discriminating you, against my community that Noah, I'm part of. So I'm not just gonna stand by and be silent. Noah? No. 
this is not a. It's consensus. not acceptable that you are discriminating against disabled people. Not even just disabled people. That just makes it worse. You're just discriminating against everyone else who can't physically make it to these Noah, meetings. You just had an not, update about a pandemic. You, you're welcome to come back up. Oh, I will. This you is, know I will. All right. So well, I'm going to continue reading my email. No. Every single person Noah, should have the same opportunity for public this comment is as everyone else. This is not a consent else. item. Currently, that is not the case. Contacting y'all by email, Noah, phone, or in person out of meeting is, this not, is not the same a as giving public item. comment at public meeting. That is a fact. Noah. It is unacceptable that the very reasonable accommodation providing Zoom call-in options is Noah, not available for all public meetings. This is accommodation Noah, that the you are being County disrespectful to the request by the mayor. Up. You are being disrespectful. I, you are, dis, you are you are no. being disrespectful. You are being incredibly ableist, so I don't really care. You are being disrespectful. I don't care if you're being disrespectful. You are Please discriminating. Please take your seat. You are committing discrimination against the community I am part of. Please take your seat. No, that's what I was saying. Oh, yes, the Johnson County Board of Supervisors is providing. So I'm extremely susceptible as because of a lack of technical ability. And as Susan Min told me a few minutes ago, it's because you don't want too much from a comment. And you and Burgess have both told me you've already decided it, so you can't apparently reverse your decisions for some bizarre reason. Even if we weren't still in pandemic, there are a number of reasons why people can't attend meetings, but would still like to. And the option, it would be able to the Zoom call and option was available. I am a disabled person. I want to be able to participate in public meetings, so my disability prevents me from being able to physically make it to said meetings. But currently, I cannot do that. It makes me feel discriminated against and that I matter less to this council than my able-bodied neighbors. Thank you. Change your damn mind and stop discriminating against me and everyone else in my community. Thank you. Are you gonna do that? Next. I'm sorry you don't care about ableism right in your community. That should be, You're you should be a one here, buddy. What? All right, we're gonna we're we're gonna all right, we're gonna we're gonna move on to the next speaker that wants to address the topic on the consent agenda. Yes, Travis Welcome. Wiper, Johnson County Auditor, Tiffin, Iowa. So not an Iowa City resident, so I can keep it brief. You have the reprecinct maps in front of you. I know there's I believe that's coming up later on. I would just like to thank the Iowa City staff for all the help that they've provided us and given us the lead way to draw the maps. Um, it's great collaboration between both governments. Um, we're happy if you don't vote on any of the maps that you like to draw some more. But I just wanted to share that everything that between Jeff and Eric Kelly, the city staff, they've been amazing to work with as we do this process. So thank you guys. Any questions? Thank you. That's good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Hi. I would like, <clears throat> excuse me, I would like to talk about the consent agenda. Um, specifically, if someone was at home and disabled and they wanted to comment on the consent agenda and they would be unable to because this council lacks hybrid meetings. A hybrid meeting allows someone to call in from Zoom. This is a, this, uh, these hybrid meetings, as shown by the Board of Supervisors, are possible, but as members of this, of this council have said before, they don't do it because they don't want a flood of public input. That's ridiculous. As shown by the Board of Supervisors, hybrid meetings are effective and they work, and the only reason this council and the city don't do it is because they want to restrict public comment. So again, if someone wanted to have something pulled from the consent agenda, they wouldn't be able to because they'd be at home. I know several people who aren't able to participate in this meeting because they couldn't physically come here. That's not democracy. That's not what this, what our government, what our country is built upon. You may, I mean, all of you, from Jeffrey to Bruce, all of you people, you don't give a damn about the public because if you did, you would allow hybrid meetings. It's possible. There's no reason why you can't. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the topic on the consent agenda? Are you coming for the consent agenda or for the open agenda?
Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, uh, uh, current City Council. Doyle, D-O-Y-L-E, Landry, L-A-N, D's and David R-Y, Positive Vision Communications. I'm asking respectfully that the item 7A be tabled for a complete diversity, equity, and inclusion review um, by respected officers um, acknowledged by the governor of Iowa in relation to fairness and equity for African Americans uh, similar to other cities in Iowa that have done the same exact thing to ensure that the contributions of African Americans, i.e. construction, have been documented, have been awarded, because as of this contribution, me stating this, there's not a single African American construction company that has been even uh, consulted in relation to building of anything in Iowa City during this fiscal year, this fiscal year. So the appropriate NAACP, Urban League, National Association of Black Journalists, National Association of Construction Professionals, we could, I can extend this past three minutes, but you sure you'll get the point. But please respectfully consider tabling 7A, uh, 7A for a further review. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address a topic on the consent agenda? Seeing no one, council discussion. I did want to point out that 8A, the uh, re-precincting, um, this is a, we have an item here to set a public hearing. The council will be having a special work session on December 7th at 8 a.m. just to have uh, further discussion. Hearing no other comments, roll call please. Oh, yes. Roll call please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salih? Before I vote, I thought we we're gonna do discussion yeah. oh. for the voting, or just when was the discussion? Yeah, that was I, I opened up discussion. Sorry, hmm? I had opened up discussion. Sorry, I don't know, but we are not discussing, right? We just vote at this time. I think if you wanted to make a comment, you can make a comment and then vote. I really would like to discuss 7A more, but I don't know at this point how we can do that. Can we bullet from the consent agenda at this point? Well, at this point, it's been moved and seconded, and we're have eight council. Or I'm sorry, six council members have voted. Um, uh, I'm not sure we can remove it at this point. I'm sorry. But I think you can make a comment if you wanted to, and then vote. No, because I I I, I wasn't really giving it attention, and there is somebody comment about it, and I saw it after we hearing them, we have like council discussion. And after that, we vote. But I don't hear you say council discussion. It was a public discussion, but it was not council discussion after that. Yeah. Oh. Isn't that the right order, or I'm mistaken? I believe I stated council discussion. No, and you then did not say it. Did I? You said roll call. Oh. As soon as the first the person finish. No. Yeah. I th I what I what I recall doing is saying council discussion, and then I jumped in to make mention about 8A, item 8A, for because I wanted to notify the public that we'll be having a special work session. Yeah, but as soon as you finish, you said roll call, you know? Like, I don't know how you're gonna solve this, but I don't think I hear that there is a council discussion here. 
And I, at that time, I would like ready to say, can we build this from the consent agenda so we can talk about it more? I think at this point, you can give a comment and then make your vote. Yeah, I would like, my comment is I would like to take this to, like, of the, cons you know, the consensus agenda and okay. make it an item on the formal agenda. Yeah. That's what my comment is. Yeah, it's because this has already been seconded and moved and seconded. I, I know what you're getting at. I think the only option is to give a comment and then make a vote. Okay. All right then. Yes. Okay. Motion passes seven to zero. We are on to item number, I believe it's 10. Item number 10, which is community comment. This is an opportunity for people to speak on any item that is not on our agenda. You will be given three minutes to speak. And this period will end at 7 p.m. Um, uh, for a total time of, well, we may extend it just a few minutes after. I'll make sure that it's open for at least 30 minutes. And also, I ask that um, people uh, address your comments to the council. And the clock is over here. There is a place where you can sign up. And I welcome everyone to come that wants to speak. Welcome. My name is Ann Houlihan, and first off, I'd like to say that we can't hear hardly anything you're saying to the public here, because it's very muffled. I'm with the Catholic Worker House, and I'm a member of the Excluded Workers Fund Coalition. I've been amazed and disappointed in this process. Iowa City and Johnson County, if I understand it correctly, received millions of ARPA dollars in April or May. Our coalition members have been attending Board of Supervisor meetings, City Council meetings, and public input sessions since April. The excluded essential workers have been speaking at these sessions. You have heard their stories, those of you who have attended, which have been very few elected officials. I thought this money was to be directed to people impacted by the pandemic, especially essential workers. I'm amazed how many hands came out needing pandemic relief, especially in the last few weeks. Few voices other than the excluded workers had been heard all year long at these sessions. The most egregious distributions, in my opinion, is the sheriff's office getting $1.2 million for GPS monitoring, which is likely to impact persons of color more than white citizens. Another distribution is 3.4 million going to Kemp Park to replace the shower house and alle alleviate pollution. Are these items which should be covered by pandemic relief? I think not. Kent Park gets nearly twice as much as essential workers. We have been discussing this need for most of a year. Finally, we got approval for $2 million from the county, but these still hold up possibly till March. Iowa City has proposed conti contributing $1.5 million to supplement the county money. That is great, a good start. The pandemic has been going on for nearly two years and these essential workers have received little, if any, relief. The money is less than what they deserve, which is what we got without lifting a finger. It is not right that they are not getting the full amount of stimulus payments we received. But that distribution should not be delayed until March and should not have strings attached. This is the holiday season. Bills are continuing to come due and the pandemic is still with us. The excluded workers need the money now. These are who I thought the money was intended for. Why are we so resistant to helping the least among us? Please approve the funds and distribute them with Johnson County with the least amount of red tape. That is proof of identity, proof of residency and stated need. Please stop the delaying tactics we are not going away. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Pat Bowen and I live in Iowa City. And I'm here tonight to ask you to finalize and complete your commitment for the Excluded Workers Fund as well. Don't drop the ball. 
Last September, Iowa City committed to contributing $1.5 million of the American Rescue Plan money to make sure that the excluded workers got at least a $2,000 stimulus check. A $1,400 check in March, which is what we're hearing it's gonna be, March of 2022, that is two full years past the beginning of this pandemic, is not good enough. Excluded workers need $2,000 in checks before Christmas. And regarding the disbursement of monies, other excluded workers funds across the country are doing the same thing. And in New Jersey, they ran into problems because the paperwork requirements were so burdensome that the size of the checks were so small, people didn't even apply for them. If that happens here, the fund will be a failure. Our government, meaning all of you, will have failed the people that you are here to serve. There, as Ann said, there needs to be little to no paperwork. She already re said them, but it's proof of residency, proof of who you are, and a self-certification of need. These people are needy. They can't wait. You promised them a, a million and a half. Now it's a time to fulfill that. And I didn't realize when this meeting started, that first issue, but as a side note, no Zoom call or comments is wrong. We are going into winter. We are going into a new COVID variant. This doesn't seem like the right time to stop this and to shut down the Zoom meetings. Your mayor, your mask order has been extended indefinitely. So do you expect people to come down here in the middle of winter? to give comments, you are cutting us off. And so I would like to request that this be implemented again. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my Hello. name is Ken Bowen. I live on the east side of Iowa City and I'm a proud member of Iowa CCI, Veterans for Peace, Chapter 161. And also, um, I am part of the Coalition for the Excluded Workers Fund. Last September, Iowa City committed contributing $1.5 million from the American Rescue Plan to make sure excluded workers got at least a $2,000 stimulus check. That was almost three months ago. Now that Johnson County has voted to create an excluded workers fund, I am here today to demand the city make good on their promise and transfer $1.5 million to the county's new fund and do it now. Excluded workers risk their lives to keep society going during the pandemic, and they're still doing that today because the pandemic hasn't gone away. It's getting worse. No cause for panic, but there is cause for concern. <sighs> They haven't had any relief, none whatsoever. A $1,400 stimulus check in March isn't good enough. Excluded workers need $2,000 by Christmas. I ask every member of this council to walk a mile in their moccasins. Think about it. You got your checks, why aren't they getting theirs? Anyway, the difference between a $2 million fund and a $3.5 million fund is the difference between $1,400 and $2,000. Iowa City has the responsibility to deliver on a pledge commitment to the excluded workers and must fully fund that plan now. Excluded workers can't wait. You promised $1.5 million and now's the time to fulfill that promise and transfer your fair share to the fund that Johnson County set up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. And we'll, ex um, we'll extend the time. Thank you. 
Hola, mi nombre es Rosa, yo soy de Guatemala. Hi, my name is Rosa, I'm from Guatemala. Estoy aquí porque nos han dado el dinero. Porque sí, nos han dado. I'm here because they've given us the money. Pero el problema es que nos están alargando más el tiempo para darnos hasta el marzo. The problem is they're um, making it too long. Uh, the process is too long. It's, we're not going to get it till March. Para nosotros es demasiado tiempo. For this, for us, this is too much time to wait. Tenemos muchas necesidades y nuestra necesidad no espera hasta en marzo. We have a lot of needs and our needs don't wait till March, can't wait till March. La renta no espera hasta el marzo. La luz no espera hasta el marzo. El hambre no espera hasta el marzo. Rent, light, that's not going to wait till March. Our, hung, our hunger won't wait for, till March. Nosotros queremos ya el dinero ya pronto. We would like the money sooner. De este mes de diciembre. Uh, this month in December. Y... Uh, 1400 no es suficiente para nosotros. A thousand and four hundred dollars is not uh, enough. Por lo menos que nos den dos mil. We need at least two thousand dollars. Nosotros hemos sufrido demasiado por el COVID. Llevamos meses para estar luchando por este dinero y no es justo que nos dan después hasta el marzo. We've suffered a lot because of COVID. We fought hard for this money and been waiting for a long time for it. And it's not just that you're going to wait till March to give it out. Las personas aquí ni siquiera eh, tuvieron que hacer esto para que llegaron el dinero hacia ellos, pero nosotros los hispanos estamos luchando días, meses, hemos sufrido hambre, hasta el calor por estar en las reuniones y ahorita por el frío y no es justo que nos, no nos den el dinero de este mes. Other people here didn't have to do anything for the money. We as Hispanics have been doing so much. Um, we've been to every meeting, waiting in the, in the, like when it was hot, and now we're starting to get into winter time and we're here in the cold. So March is not soon enough. Espero que comprenden eso. Por favor, que nos den ya pronto el dinero. Gracias. I hope you understand this and that you um, get the money sooner. Please, thank you. Thank you, gracias. Welcome. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Ninosca Campos. Ya ustedes me conocen de la Coalición de Trabajadores Excluidos de Iowa. Hi, good evening. My name is Ninosca Campos. You all know me from the Excluded Workers Fund. Estamos aquí exigiendo el millón y medio de dólares que ustedes nos prometieron. We're here insisting that uh, you give out the 1.5 million dollars that you promised. Como ustedes saben, el condado del Johnson County ya nos proporcionó dos millones de dólares. You know Johnson County approved two million dollars. Pero con dos millones de dólares la gente solo se viera beneficiada con un cheque pequeño de 1,400 dólares. But that's not enough with two million dollars. It would only be a small check of maybe 1,400 dollars. 1,400 dólares no son lo suficientemente justas para todas las personas que se vieron afectadas durante el coronavirus. 1,400 dollars is not nearly enough for all the people that have suffered during this. You know that these are some of the most vulnerable families and they suffered the most. Nosotros necesitamos que ustedes nos den el millón y medio de que nos prometieron. We need you, that you, we need you to also give the 1.5 million dollars to the fund that you promised. Para unir ese dinero con el dinero que tiene el John Sinconi, el que nos proporcionó el condado. Unite the $1.5 million, uh, she's referring to this money, to the $2 million that Johnson County has voted to hand out the money. Para que cada una de estas personas que ustedes miran ahora aquí y las han visto en todas las reuniones presentes, obtengan un cheque de $2,000. So that all the people that you see here in front of you and all the other people that have come to the meetings receive a cheque of $2,000. Ustedes tienen que tener palabra de lo que nos prometieron. You have to keep your word of what you're promising. Nosotros no queremos esperar hasta el mes de marzo. We ya hemos esperado lo suficientemente bastante. We don't want to wait till March. We've waited enough. Todavía estamos en pandemia, aún no termina. We're still in this pandemic. It hasn't stopped. Eso qué quiere decir que estemos vacu que estemos vacunados no significa que no podemos infectarnos. It doesn't mean anymore that just because we're vaccinated doesn't uh, that we can't get the virus. Entonces yo aquí como líder de la coalición de trabajadores excluidos de Iowa vengo a exigir que nos den el millón y medio que nos 
que nos van a proporcionar. So I'm here as one of the leaders of the Funded Excluded Worker Coalition that um, you give us this money. Para que cada una de estas personas obtenga en el mes de diciembre su cheque. So each one of these people in the month of December gets their check. No queremos esperar más. Ustedes tienen el poder, el poder y el control de la ciudad. We don't want to wait anymore. You have the control and the power of Porque the city. Porque Illinois va a proporcionar mil dólares a sus habitantes. Ya vieron en las noticias. Did you see in Illinois they're giving out a thousand dollars to their um, inhabitants? Ustedes por qué teniendo el control de esta ciudad no pueden dar a la gente lo que han prometido? And why, with you guys having the power of this city, you are not completing what you promised? ¿Qué les cuesta dar el millón y medio? Soy lo suficientemente clara y les digo las cosas como son. Uh, what does it um, kind of cost to you? I'm being clear that we want this money. Y si se molesta, lo siento. And if you're bothered by this, I'm sorry. Y me van a ver en todas las reuniones porque esta ha sido mi lucha desde el mes de abril. And you'll keep seeing me in the meetings. Y yo lucho por cada una de estas personas que vienen saliendo de trabajar para venir a pedir lo que les prometieron. Because I'm also fighting for each of these people you see in front of you who've left work to come here. Las cosas como son, señores. Las cosas se prometen, pero se cumplen. Keep your promises. Y nosotros no queremos esperar más. We don't want to wait longer. Necesitamos el dinero de ustedes para tener un cheque de dos mil dólares para cada persona. Y que no pongan tantas restricciones tampoco. We need this money from you guys to join the city so that we have a bigger check and creo, not to put restrictions on it. Creo que es suficientemente que una persona tenga un ID con su dirección para que comprueben que viven en el estado de Iowa. It should be enough with an ID that person can prove that they live in the city of Iowa City. Que no andan usando tanta protocolo para dar un cheque a las personas. Not being proposed, not be proposing all kind of porque protocols. Cuando, porque cuando nosotros trabajamos haciendo los trabajos tan duros que hacemos en el estado de Iowa. Uh, because we're doing all the hard work of Iowa. A nosotros no nos piden tanto protocolo. Nosotros hacemos el trabajo tal y cual nos dicen. They're not asking for all these protocols. They tell us what to do and we do it. Pero ya estamos cansados de venir a tantas reuniones, a tantas reuniones y a veces no crean, a veces nos decepcionamos. We're tired of coming to all these meetings. Why don't que, you believe us? O quieren que nos decepcionemos, pero no estamos hechos para eso. We're not here for to be deceived. Si sacamos la economía de este país a diario con el trabajo forzoso que hacemos, we um, lift up or even um, sort of um, carry this economy with all the hard work that we no do. Aquí no van a tener en todas las reuniones. ¿Cómo? Aquí no van a tener en todas las reuniones. Sí, no van a tener. Aquí no van a tener oh. presente en todas las reuniones. Then you're going to see us here in all the meetings. Ahorita no nos quisieron dar ni intérprete. And you don't want to give us an interpreter. Pensando que nos iban a callar nuestra voz. Thinking that maybe that would shut our voice. Y nosotros vamos a alzar nuestra voz. But we'll keep using our voice. Porque nosotros tenemos derechos. Because we have rights. Así como de mi cheque yo pago mis impuestos. Just like from my check, I pay taxes. Así como yo hago mis taxas. Just how I do my taxes. Así yo tengo los mismos derechos que cualquiera de uno de ustedes puede tener. I have the same rights as just like each and every one of you. Y yo lucho por todas estas personas vulnerables. And I'm fighting for all of these vulnerable people. Y solo people. exigimos que nos den el millón y medio que nos prometieron. And we're asking for you to give the 1.5 million that you promised. Queremos estos cheques para el mes de diciembre. We want these checks for the month of December. Ni agradeciendo de antemano, ¿verdad? Que pues siempre nos atienden en las reuniones. Thank you for Gracias. attending us to us. Thank you. Welcome. Hola, buenas noches. Hi, good evening. Mi nombre es Leonel Ángel González. My name is Leon Ángel González. Uh, hoy vengo a decirle de sobre sobre el cheque que nos que nos permitieron para el para este año pues hoy les vengo a decirles de que pues estoy <coughs> contento o no sé o, o, o enojado porque nos están diciendo que para qué para quién esperar hasta mes de marzo de ese cheque que nos pueden dar en este mes que viene en diciembre I'm here to talk about the check that we're going to get, and I'm feeling happy and also upset or mad because of the wait period till March. Como me ven, vengo saliendo de trabajo, de trabajar. I just got off work. Y, es, y en cambio estoy aquí. 
And I'm here today. Esperando o, o con esperanza de recibir ese cheque antes del, del 24 de, de diciembre. With some kind of hope that um, I'm going to receive this check sooner. Para mí sería algo maravilloso o, o una ayuda. For me, it would be something so beautiful. It would be a big help. Recibir ese cheque a ese a esa fecha sería pues un gran ayuda para mí. ¿Por qué? To receive this check sooner, it'd be a huge help. And why? Una cosa es pasamos ya casi dos años del de la pandemia. One thing is we've um, almost completed two years since we've been in this pandemic. El primer año no recibimos nada y estuvimos, bueno, más que en mi, en mi persona, yo trabajé. The first year we didn't receive anything and as a, for myself, I worked through it, or I worked. ¿Por, ¿por qué? Why? Porque nadie, nadie nos iba a dar nada sabiendo de que somos Inmigrante. Because nobody was going to give us anything knowing that we're immigrants. Entonces, entonces la idea era de que teníamos el riesgo de contagiarnos y la otra es de pagar lo, los biles, la renta y todo lo demás. So we carried this risk that we could get infected so we could continue to pay our bills. Y en cambio, pero ahí estuvimos buscando la manera de cómo conseguir para pagar todo eso durante la pandemia. But eso. There, during the pandemic, we were there, we were out looking for ways that we could pay, make our, make payments. Pero eso fue el año que cuando comenzó la pandemia. Y otra cosa, buscando eso, digamos, esa manera de cómo pagar la renta, llegó, llegó el, el mes de Marzo, febrero, pagar sobre los taxes de cada año. And then, uh, so this is what happened the first year. And then another thing on top of that came the months of March and February, finding ways to pay these taxes. Para mí fue duro. It was hard for me. Porque tenía que pagar el taxe, el bill, la renta. I had to pay taxes, the bills, and rent. Y no teniendo apoyo de nadie, ni del gobierno with support from nobody, not even the government. Entonces, el segundo año, que fue este de enero a esta fecha. And then talking about the second year, January to where we're at now. Igual. The same. Buscamos la manera de cómo pagar la renta y pagar de cada año los taxes. Looking for a way to make rent and to pay taxes. Y sin ningún apoyo. And without any support. En cambio, ahí estuvimos y paga, y yo, en mi persona, yo pagué mis taxes. I paid my taxes. Para mí, el primer año de del pandemia, yo tuve que pagar mis taxes la cantidad de $1,500 dólares. During the first year of the pandemic, I paid my taxes and I had to pay an amount of $1,500. Y, me, doy, y me, me estoy dando cuenta ahorita del cheque que me están dando de 1.400, ¿se imaginan? And now I'm just thinking the check of 1.400, can you imagine? Dime, ¿en qué me puede ayudar en esa 1.400? Si, si ustedes nos pueden dar los 2.000, sería para mí, es un gran ayuda, pero es una ayuda. Tell me, what will this do? If you guys can give out the $2,000, this would be a huge help. Lo único que pido hoy, esta noche, como todos los, todas las veces que hemos estado aquí durante esos meses que hemos estado luchando por esto, cheque que nos, que nos, que nos pueden dar y, está, y estoy con esperanza que nos den ya en esta fecha que viene. The only thing that I'm asking tonight, you know, throughout all these meetings that we've been in, is that you can give us this check um, this month that's coming. Para mí sería un para mí sería un gran ayuda. This would be a huge help for me. Y otra cosa es de que esperemos y que ustedes todo lo que dijeron durante durante ese tiempo que estuvimos aquí que nos 
que nos den su palabra de que nos, nos den el cheque este diciembre. And the other thing is that you keep your word that you're going to um, give out the money and that you give the check out in December. Antemano, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to talk during this time on any item that is not on the agenda? I'm just following the list and um, I'm looking, is it Doyle? He's next. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're next. <clears throat> Welcome. Good evening again, Mayor, the City Council, and the employees paid out of taxes to manage the city. On, Mar on November 30th, 1955, the residents of Montgomery had a meeting and decided the next day we act. We're not going to discuss about what to do with our money but when we remove our money, the world will notice. December 1st, 1955, December 1st, 1955, the start of the Montgomery bus boycott. 381 days of African-American residents deciding, no thanks, we'll walk. When you remove your money, everyone notices. I state that because of what I asked as a United States Marine Corps veteran during public uh, con the consent about tabling, tabling, because sometimes when you sit with someone who you currently disagree with, doesn't mean that you don't like the person, just means you disagree with the person on an issue. I state that because this cup of coffee came from the Java house. I specifically purchased it because of one person on the council who, when she did not know who I was and thought, hmm, I'll take the meeting at the Java House where I found out that council lures birthday. And she made a simple request. Just don't publicize my birthday. I, as a United States Marine Corps veteran, I may not like what someone has to say, but I will respect it because of the oath that I took to defend this life, to use my life to defend this country and what it stands for. So I may not like being called a certain name that starts with an N and ends with an R. I may not like being treated like one, but there's a difference between that word and a W-I-N-N-E-R. Tonight, there are residents here in Iowa City who are white, who are considering the same actions as the Montgomery residents from 1955 on the November 30th. They are the majority in Iowa City and understand that African American residents and taxpayers continue to be ignored. So. Businesses can't earn a profit if residents don't spend their money. Consider yourself advised. Thank you. Thank you. You're, thank you. We have the next person coming, please. Thank you. Oh, I wasn't going to say anything else. I just need to do something on the record. I, Welcome. It's the same envelope a certain counselor got about her birthday. Thank you. Next, welcome. Um, I don't need a really big introduction. Everybody know who I am. Um, I just want to say that I've been working with for the Eric program. Harris. Thank you. Um, I've been working with these guys since the beginning of the last year, and I've seen them do a lot of hard work. I've even saw some of the jobs that they do and some of the work that they do. and. I'm not saying that an American person wouldn't do those jobs, but some of those jobs are tough. So I just got a few facts that I want to, you know, just kind of put out there. Um, you know, it's it, like it was just Thanksgiving. It was just Christmas. 
Um, and when you go to the store, you can see the difference in the prices. So, so why not, you know, give these guys this money that they're asking for at the end of this year? They're going to go through Christmas, through Thanksgiving, and at the end of that, they're going to be struggling still when they were already struggling through a two-year pandemic. Now, my next point is, and these are things that I don't want to challenge people on. I just want people to just get this in their mind. Everybody has been paying attention to what's been going on, that we have a potential to have a pandemic part two, which could be worse. We just need to wait until the information comes out and we can figure out what's going on with it. So are we going to sit and wait until a different variant of the pandemic comes out and then say, hey, we should have gave those guys some money to help them because now they need more? Because we don't know about this new variant, but if you pay attention to the alarm that the government gives and the things that happen, we may not know about how bad it is at first, but eventually we will figure out how bad it is. So to struggle through the past couple of years with the pandemic, and when the last pandemic you know, first started up really bad, it kind of was like around this time of the year. So that kind of matches up. Um, these, all of these people in this room, I have something in common with them. I struggled through the pandemic. I was kicked off unemployment when my family had COVID. And I'm not afraid to say that I'm also a formerly incarcerated person. So I struggled during the pandemic. My wife had COVID. Three of my children had COVID. We struggled during the pandemic. And I worked an essential job as well, similar to one of these jobs that all these people in this room probably worked, making people beds, making sure people eat, making sure people get their food that they order out. Those people were in, in those kitchens. And just like they say, they pay taxes just like every other person. And I'm an American, an American citizen. So it means a lot to me that we help these people out. Well, I wouldn't be standing up here saying it because I have every right to get all the help in the world, but it's just my personal cause to help all these people out in this room. Thank you. I'm going to automatically give 10 more minutes, but I'll, I wanted to just see a, a hand of those that was wanting to speak. Yeah. We have like three on our team. Okay. Um, so we're going to go till 720, and I'm going to drop the time to two minutes. Buenas noches, honorables autoridades del condado de Johnson. Uh, good evening, honorable uh, city council members. Eh, pues, como ven en mi cartel dice, escucha mi voz. Y no solamente mi voz, sino que la de estas familias que están aquí hoy presentes en esta reunión. What you can eh, see in the paper that I'm holding says, listen to my, my voice. And not just mine, but all the people that you see standing before you. Pues como ven, nosotros somos habitantes más de esta ciudad y nos sentimos prácticamente ciudadanos de esta ciudad. Well, como, we are residents or inhabitants of this city and we feel like we're citizens of this city. Queremos ser siempre incluidos en esta sociedad de esta ciudad. We want to be included in this, um, this city. Eh, por lo tanto, vivimos confinados, eh, Durante la pandemia y pues hemos luchado contra contra todo en este tiempo que hemos estado con esta severa enfermedad con este severo virus. All the things that we've lived, lived through during this pandemic, all the things that we've we've fighted fought for. Y como habitante de esta ciudad quisiera de antemano pedirles que que sean solidarios <coughs> para con nosotros. Porque nos sentimos ciudadanos, el cual nosotros pagamos nuestros impuestos. And as people of the city, we're asking you to stand in solidarity with us. Y, contribu y contribuimos con trabajo, con impuestos, día a día luchamos y no pararemos de luchar. We Vamos pay taxes and we contribute every day to the city through our work. Contribuyendo a este gran país y contribuyendo a esta ciudad para... Desarrollarla y que cada día sea mejor. Uh, we contribute to this grand country and to this city so that um, it's better. Queremos que 
sean ustedes los que tomen la decisión, yo siento en mi corazón de que ustedes son personas nobles y de que esta noche ustedes van a ayudarnos, de que esta noche ustedes van a tomar la mejor decisión. Para we'll poder... see what kind of decision that you make, but I feel in my heart that you are noble. Y van a podernos ayudar con esta petición que nosotros tenemos. And you're going to make a, the right decision and help us with this petition that we're asking. El tiempo que nos están dando es demasiado largo. The time that you're making, making us wait is too long. Las familias, nuestras familias necesitan. Nosotros necesitamos y quién más que ustedes para poder ayudarnos. The need is there. Families need this. We need this. And what better way than you guys to help? Quisiéramos que ustedes, pues, como personas honorables, como personas de palabra, como personas correctas. We would like to ask you as honorable people, as people who keep their word. Nos, nos ayuden con esta petición y podernos anticipar el plazo. Creo que no... No es algo que no, no esté en sus manos. Claro que ustedes pueden hacerlo. To help us with this ask, I believe it is something that you can do. It's something in, in your control, in your hands. Por mi parte, es todo. Muy buenas noches y confío de que ustedes van a poder ayudarnos. Uh, that's all for my part, and I am confident that you guys will help us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, I'm not public com making public comment right now. I'm just going to say that I think two minutes for people who need translation is unfair. It should be at least four. Furthermore, I think you should let everybody who needs to speak speak, regardless of whether that goes beyond 720. So that's what's going to happen. Thank you. State, state your name, just for public record. Uh, Santa Claus. Um, <laughs> no, I'm Dan. Welcome. Hi, my name is Rosemary Andino, and I live in Iowa City in the east side. And $1.5 million is not enough for this community, for Iowa City alone. Are you serious? I'm with these guys. I support them, okay? I help them in every way that I can possibly can. $1.5 million is not going to be enough. I have car travel in $1,400 ain't going to cover it, but just labor, okay? All these even individuals here, they don't have benefits like all of you, all of us in this room. Consider the medicine that they got to go through, the rent, the bills, and every little detail that they got to do. Half of these people don't get food stamps, like half of these people that are that do in Iowa City. It's... It's 1.5 enough to support your community? Absolutely not. No, not even close. Are you guys gonna hear us? Absolutely not. Why, because you guys think we're gonna give up? No, we're not gonna give up. We're gonna get stronger. This is just the beginning. Half of them couldn't even come. Why, because the limit of seats that are in this room. Half of them can't speak English, that's why they're afraid to stand behind the doors because you guys don't want to hear him out. If you was to give an interpreter, absolutely, you'll hear him. But why are you being so shy about 1.5 when we're the ones that provide for half of you when you order out, put a roof on your house or a door or whatever the case be? You, who do you call? Somebody that is behind these doors. I'm sure half of you guys have problems in your house. Do you guys call a plumber? Do you guys consider how much he gets paid? Thank you. <sighs> Thank you. Welcome. Bienvenido. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Ken, uh, Ken good, good evening, my name is Ken Padillo. <clears throat> Este, les agradezco por, por este espacio, por esta oportunidad de citarnos a que viniéramos a este lugar. Uh, thanking you for this space, um, for having us here. Este, lo primero es que sé que todos hemos sufrido en la pandemia, tanto como ellos, ustedes, nosotros. I know that we've all suffered in the pandemic, just like they have us, all of you. Y 
Cada quien hizo lo que hizo para salir adelante. Everyone did what they could to move ahead or get out of it. Hablo en nombre de los ruferos. I'm talking on behalf of the roofers. De Iowa City. Of Iowa City. Eh, en este caso, nosotros como, como personas, como migrantes, les agradecemos la ayuda que nos, nos están dando. In this case, um, como people, immigrants, we are grateful for the help that we're getting. Y si ustedes creen que es considerable 1,400 dólares. And have you can, if you've considered that 1,400 dólares. Está bien para, para, para ustedes is darnos okay, esto. It's okay for you guys to give to us. Pero, ven, nosotros ya viene invierno. But look, winter is coming. Y $1,400 dólares solo cubren cuatro meses de renta. $1,400 is only going to cover para four que, months of rent. Para los que pagamos menos que otros. And that's depending on how much you pay. Some pay more, some pay less. Pero cubre nuestra comida. Will it cover our food? <coughs> y si lo ven de esta manera, no fue tanto la pandemia, es tanto lo menos que nos miran. It's not only the pandemic, it's how they see us. Y esto los afecta más a nosotros psicológicamente que físicamente. This affects us more mentally than physically. Es peor el afecto físicamente, psicológicamente, perdón, que físicamente. The mental effect is a lot worse than the physical effect. Este, $1,400 dólares para esta etapa que estamos no los ajusta. $1,400 dólares for this um, stage that we're in is not enough. Podemos pasar la pandemia porque era verano, había trabajo. Ahorita ya no hay trabajo. We could get through the summer during the pandemic because, um, uh, because of the work, but now comes winter and we're not going to make it. Y aunque no lo miren de esta manera algunas personas, pero somos una parte del desarrollo de Iowa City. And some people might not see it like this, but we're a part of the development of Iowa City. Entonces, perdón, entonces... Pedimos que sean más considerables con nosotros. So we ask that you be more considerate with us. Y que si di dijeron algo que nos iban a ayudar. If you say something like you're going to help us. Que cumplan su palabra porque no están, no están incumpliendo ante nosotros. Se están incumpliendo ustedes mismos. Uh, that you do it. Because you're not just, um, um, you're not just like holding the agreement with us, but with your, your own selves. Muchas gracias por su tiempo y... Buenas noches. Thank you for your time and buen, uh, good evening. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. The uh, Fix My Arise uh, with Estig Planning and um, not actually sure which one of these is ours. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody who's here, um, and uh, I know how hard it is to speak your truth in front of power, and I just really commend everybody from the Excluded Workers Fund for speaking your voice. Uh, so I am here actually to talk about a grant that um, our company received. Um, it's the, from the Human Rights Commission, the um, Social Justice and Racial Equity Grant. We, uh, I've been before you before uh, to talk about some updates, and my team is here actually along with one of the residents who attended a, the training for the ha um, housing advocacy initiative. Sorry about that. Um, what happened? Okay, there we go. So um, I'm just going to give you a really quick general overview of the project, and um, just wanted to say that a huge thank you to um, Councillor Weiner and Mayor Bruce Teague, also Jessica Andino and Maria Pedron for attending uh, our event um, where we had, you know, our attendees for the training were able to ask questions, be um, listened to, and, and to hear some of the experiences that councillors and the mayor have had. Um, because I, when we're talking about affordable housing um, and the impacts of that, particularly in COVID, um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of emotion, and um, really what we're trying to do, though, is to create a space for residents and um, to become advocates for themselves. So instead of having nonprofits and organizations come and say, you know, this is what the need is for, for residents, much like the Excluded Workers Fund, to be able to organize and advocate for themselves. So um, I'm here with my staff today to kind of just give you a quick dose of that, and then also to um, hear Magali, who will share her story as well. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. 
Hello, uh, my name is Heki Jamili, and uh, I'll be talking about the first phase of the project that V just mentioned. Uh, the first phase of our project was community outreach, and it consisted of a community survey and one affordable housing resources event, which, was, which spanned across two days, and we met with the residents and heard their concerns and uh, pointed them out towards resources that they could use reg with regards to affordable housing uh, for the short and long term. And uh, during that event, we also conducted a survey in order to gauge the barriers towards accessing affordable housing in Iowa City and in the county. And uh, one of the questions that we asked during the survey was, do you want to participate in a housing advocacy training? And uh, 34 out of 48 participants said yes to that. And that was the second part or phase of our project. We conducted a three hour long training session followed by a 45 minutes discussion with city officials, city, uh, including the city council members, uh, members from the Iowa City Human Rights Commission, Planning and Zoning Commission, etc. And uh, there the residents had a chance to not only get familiarized with the faces, but also feel comfortable uh, sharing their concerns. Uh, another thing that we did during this training was that we took some of the concerns that the residents had pointed out uh, during the survey and walked them through a step-by-step -step process for advocacy for those things. Uh, I'm talking about teaching from teaching them to how to write emails and letters to officials, to how to make phone calls, how to appear for the, to, before the city council, and how to even create neighborhood unions of their own so that they could uh, magnify their voices, and uh, many more. But in order to talk about the next part of the project, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Heki. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Asmita Paudel from west side of Iowa City. I'm with Estic Planning as well. Um, so with all of the resources we collected and materials we prepared for the two phases, um, the survey and training, for the advocacy initiative. We collected all of those and created an affordable housing advocacy initiative toolkit. And the main purpose of this toolkit is for it to be replicable throughout the Iowa City and Johnson County area for future similar events for um, housing advocacy. Um, and um, the toolkit is around uh, 30 pages of document and it will be made available online soon for public um, view. Um, so talking about the materials that are present in the toolkit, we have presented um, uh, different action items um, that, can be, um, uh, that can be used to have a successful community survey and affordable housing advocacy training conducted in a neighborhood. Um, um, and also we have also included um, sample um, survey questionnaire and sample flyers, sample banner signages, um, um, like training materials and pamphlet and everything that we already created during the initiative. And um, so we, we are really hopeful that um, the community will find this toolkit beneficial and will be used in future events. Um, lastly, I would like to say that um, um, on behalf of Estic Planning, thank you to the city for providing us this opportunity and um, um, being supportive throughout the initiative. Um, also, uh, um, wrapping up the project, we um, followed up with the community, the training participants again, and to see if they would like to accompany us to city council meeting to talk during a community um, comment section. So one of them is here, and she will tell her story. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Magali Yengo. I just moved in uh, Iowa City like three months ago. I moved with my five-year-old. So for some personal reason, I had to move here so we can have a better life and hope to get it a new beginning. So the first thing I was comforted, the struggle I have, the first one was housing. So I noticed something, there's no public housing in the city. So which make my move very difficult here. So when I landed in Iowa City, I was living with some friends in a family, but I couldn't stay longer than two months. I had to move and find my way. So I look around, check online, there was no affordable housing. I'm a single mom, 
I'm a hard worker, I'm, an, I'm not a lazy woman. But where I came from, we used to have, I, I used to benefit the public uh, income-based program for housing. And here, there's none. So it didn't help me to get a chance to move. So I fell alone with this five-year-old trying to, I put him in a school close to the place when I moved in, in that family. So I was looking, checking the rent, very, very expensive. So to be able to have an affordable or something comfortable is start from 800, that's the cheapest I think, 800, dollars for 850, 900. So when I get here, it was pretty difficult to get something that will help me and my son to call Iowa City a home. So th this is, th that was the first. The second thing was the credit, st uh, the credit score. I never had any issue to pay my rent. I never been late, I never had any issue. But when I get here, they have to check my credit story. Thank you. Your time is up, but thank you for your story. Welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Tara McGovern. I'm here to speak on a different topic, but I want to unequivocally say that I echo each person here in asking that they receive the money, their money, the money that's been promised them, not yours, as soon as possible. Um, but I'm actually here to speak about accessibility. Um, neither Noah nor Dan we're out of order in advocating for basic access to this meeting because every person in our community is a member of our democracy and currently we are out of order. Um, many of us here are aware that it was our senator, Democratic Senator Tom Harkin, that authored the American with Disabilities Act 31 years ago. And um, this municipality, along with many others, are in violation and I suggest that we fix it all together because um, we're supposed to be leaders in that way. So speaking about uh, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, I would specifically like to call attention to section two, which applies to state and local governments and um, protects qualified individuals with disabilities from discrimination. So um, within the section two, if you look at the ADA.gov website and you backslash COM, P-O-R-O, -O, common problems. There's an, there's an aspect here that specifically relates to public meetings. Um, in terms of program accessibility, Title II requires city governments to ensure that all of their program services and activities, when viewed in their entirety, are accessible to people with disabilities. And when choosing between possible methods of program accessibility, city governments must give priority to the choices that offer services, programs, and activities in the most integrated setting possible. So um, if the ADA isn't, isn't of enough interest to you, maybe we can pivot to um, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, because there's actually another great website, um, section508.gov, that outlines specifically how to create accessible meetings. Now, it's a federal, it's a federal Thank you. law. That's, that's Thank all. you. Okay, I have actually more to say, so I'll, I'll write it up and I'll get it to all of you. Um, Thank you. And I, I recommend that you listen to people with disabilities because Thank they're not you. represented here. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, hello again. Um, also, to start off solidarity um, with the Exclusive Workers Fund, uh, yeah, give them that 1.5 million right now, even though that is, you need to give them a whole lot more than 1.5 million, but give that to them right now before the end of the year. Like, there's no excuse. Stop dragging your feet. Just freaking do it. You have the money, so do it. Please um, state your name and address, please. My name is Noah, and I'm not going to give you my address. Uh, second point, uh, fire the cops that arrested the political arrest of the TRC chair immediately. You cannot allow that fascism to stand in our community and just tell the cops or can just do political arrests whenever they feel like it. Third, I'm going to read my email again, so hopefully you'll understand this time. Now, I will expand on the need for having Zoom call in public. Yeah, I'm going to extend it for having Zoom call in public comment at meetings. Every single person should have the same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case. Contacting y'all by email, phone, or in person out of a meeting is not the same as giving public comment at a meeting, and that is a fact. 
It is unacceptable that the very reasonable accommodation providing Zoom call-in options is not available for all public meetings. It is an accommodation that the Johnson County Board of Supervisors and the Iowa City TRC are providing, so there's no excuse for y'all to not be providing that. We are still in a pandemic. Currently, people who, do not, who cannot safely make it because they literally fear for their death if they come to a public meeting with this many people in it. Sorry, I got a lot. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Thoughts of me are being discriminated against. Even if we weren't still in a pandemic, there are a number of reasons people cannot attend meetings. We'll still like to and, be, and should and need to have that possibility of accessibility for Zoom and call in meetings available. I'm a disabled person. I want to be able to participate in public meetings when my disability prevents me from being Thank able you. to physically make it to the meetings. But currently, Thank you. I can't do that. It makes me feel discriminated. Noah, I am being Thank discriminated you. against, and I feel like I matter less to my local Noah. government than my able-bodied neighbors. Thank you. Make your meetings accessible, then. And don't, don't give a human rights proclamation if you're going to continue discrimination thank at you. your meetings. Don't call them public meetings. Noah, thank Bruce, you. Bruce, Bruce. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Cobble. Um, I would like to comment about several different things. Firstly, why the hell doesn't the city provide translation services to folks at these meetings? In an email to uh, excluded workers fund leader David Goodner, uh, Jeffrey Fruin said, hey, the city won't provide translators to public commenters at, at public meetings. What the hell is that? That I mean, that continues the trend of the city not being accessible and the city government refusing to be acceptable to folks. Um, also, I can't believe the cognitive uh, dissonance presented by the mayor and other city officials during the work session earlier this evening. Many, in the, uh, many of the setbacks and difficulties experienced by the TR TRC have stemmed directly from the antagonism of you, Bruce, and the city government as a whole. Um, nothing exemplifies that more than the arrest of the TRC chair Mo Traore by ICPD, who were emboldened by your terrible rhetoric. Um, none of you mentioned that during the work session. None of you mentioned his arrest, which I think is one of the most disconcerting things that's happened to the TRC during its existence. Um, Mr. Mayor, you need to stop kissing Roy Sandporter's ring and let this commission, which he has made it her personal mission to destroy because commissioners resisted her abuses, you need to let the commission do its work. Mayor Teague and Councillor Sully, the fact that you are refusing to approve the facilitator wanted by the TRC is clear evidence that you are putting politics and the greed of Iowa City's nonprofit co complex above the welfare of the community. Also, and this is coming directly from TRC Commissioner Amel Ali, who is an Iowa City treasure, very few of you have paid attention to their work or meetings. Speaking of Amel, I would like to talk about the accessibility of these meetings. She wanted to comment here tonight during public comment, but couldn't because the council does not allow hybrid, me hybrid meetings featuring Zoom. Um, such hybrid meetings are possible and work as shown by the county um, board of supervisors meetings. So, I mean, y'all need to do better. Just thank you. Come on. Thank you. All right. We appreciate everyone that has come up during public comment. So, thank you for sharing your. Thank you for sharing during public comment. Public comment is closed at this time, though. Are you, are you not going to let her speak? Public comment is closed at this time. Bruce, she's a commissioner. You didn't let her speak during your work session. What the we, are, we are moving on to item number 11, planning and zoning matters. If a majority of the council is in, uh, we're going to move on to 11A, which is comprehensive plan amendment, Southwest District. Resolution to, I'm going to wait until you're. I, I, I'll keep going if you're going to wait. I think the city government is in the time. Dan. The DRC is awful. You said you were going to wait. Dan, I'm moving on to 11A. You're not letting a commissioner of the TRC comment. You didn't we are at comprehensive plan 11A hmm. amendment. Are you going to arrest me again? Southwest District. This is a resolution to amend the Southwest District Plan and Iowa City 2030 Comprehensive Plan to allow an intensive commercial and open space land uses for the property southwest of IVW Road Southwest and west of Slough Slother Road. And I'm going to open up the public hearing. 
And we're going to start with comments from staff at this time. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Danielle Sisman, Neighborhood and Development Services. Let me get my pockets empty here, sorry. Um, the agenda items on your uh, agenda tonight, there are three of them that are related to each other, so I'm going to give one presentation on all three. There will be motions at the end individually. So as the Mayor introduced, the first agenda item, 11A, is a comprehensive plan amendment for IWV Road Southwest. There is a following um, application regarding an annexation of that land into the city of Iowa City, as well as a rezoning of that land to a city zoning district. Um, so as I said, I'll give one presentation for all three. Um, this is land generally located at the west uh, of the intersection of IWV Road Southwest and Slathour Road. Um, the applicant is uh, represented by um, uh, MMS John Martyr and Josh Entler, who I believe will be available later for questions if you have any. Um, this is approximately 70 acres, generally located as I described and bounded here in white. Um, it is uh, just west of Highway 218 for a little bit of uh, context. Um, as far as landmarks go, uh, it's also near the Iowa National Armory, Guard Armory, which is on the north side of IWV Road, Johnson County um, Poor Farm, the historic site. Also the location of the Jack, the Joint Emergency Communications Center, just to the east of that, as well as the Johnson County Secondary Roads uh, Facilities Building and the Iowa City Landfill, just to the southwest. Um, as I said, there are three applications, a comp plan amendment and annexation and a rezoning. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission had a hearing on these items on September 16th, uh, at which time they thought they had approved all three items. Uh, turns out we did not make them aware that the vote they needed to have on the comp plan was insufficient for passing. Uh, technically had a majority vote, but the ordinance requires four votes of the uh, membership. So um, that uh, application needed to come back. Because that comprehensive plan amendment needed to come back, it also uh, triggered some um, conditions that needed to be added to the rezoning uh, uh, action as well. Um, and they also did need to amend their comprehensive plan uh, proposal so that it would be a different action for them to consider. Um, this is the uh, current zoning of the property. It's shown, bounded again in white here. Uh, it's currently zoned a county zoning district and part of the subject property is already actually in the city of Iowa City. That's the grayish uh, rectangle on the right. Um, it's surrounded by residential, county residential uh, zoning as well as county agri ag uh, agricultural zoning. Um, the comprehensive plan amendment under consideration tonight is to two of our long-range plans, uh, the general uh, long-range plan called our comprehensive plan as well as the more specific district plan, which is the southwest district plan. The amendments are to the maps that are included in those plans as well as some of the text and uh, description of the, the general area. This shows the original application for the comprehensive plan amendment to the Southwest District Plan. It's bounded in red. Um, the area was previously designation, de designated in this plan as future and urban development, which was a bit of a placeholder for future consideration in the, in the future. It had been designated this since 1997 and not really revisited in the comprehensive plan consideration. Um, this is, again, the initial application to the comprehensive um, plan amendment as well. I'm sorry, the initial application of the Southwest Plan Submittal Map. This is the revised uh, and currently proposed uh, comprehensive plan amendment. You'll see two different colors in that same area. The lighter color uh, oriented uh, east to west is a uh, vegetative and noise and site buffer strip that was added to the proposal, propo uh, formerly proposing a, a buffer between the proposed area to be considered for the rezoning in the future and uh, properties to the south. And this is the applicant's revised, I'm sorry, comprehensive plans map. So the, a different map as in another plan, but basically showing the same concept where part of the land would be rezoned eventually to an intensive commercial use and there'd be a vegetative buffer. Um, the comprehensive plans, uh, long, these long range district maps have different uh, keys and different legends to them. So they're color coded slightly differently and identified in different ways, but they're meant to represent the same thing. Um, with comprehensive plan amendments, we have two criteria that staff considers. One is change, circumst change circumstances, and the other one is compatibility with uh, the other goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan. 
Regarding change circumstances, as I mentioned, this has been a bit, a bit of a placeholder since 1997. And considering this application, st staff did look back towards um, how those uh, comprehensive plans were formulated and what was considered at the time that they were developed. Also looked back at the patterns of development that have occurred in this area over time. Um, as far back as the 90s, there had been really very little uh, development in this side of town. Rare Road was really just beginning to be developed. Certainly Camp Cardinal had not seen the de residential development that we've seen since then. Um, there had been a, more of a focus on commercial development along Highway 1 and 218 as a preferred location. Also, it wasn't anticipated that, that infrastructure would be available. And many of those things have changed over time, as well as the fact that looking forward, um, staff analyzed uh, population growth to 2040, which is the boundary of the long-range planning that the city does in various ways, including the MPO, anticipating significant uh, population growth, and then and the uh, center of that growth kind of shifting around uh, in its emphasis, and uh, definitely coming to land closer to this intersection and closer to these parts of town. So really uh, indicating that conditions have changed, and it is time to reconsider this um, particular part of town. As far as compatibility with um, the comprehensive plan and its other um, goals and objectives, um, there is definitely a public need to encourage um, commercial areas. Many of our commercial areas uh, inside the city limits are more rail oriented, um, and we really identified that um, well, they may be, there may be some land available for that. It's not readily developable, and that there is a steady and projected need for this kind of development. Moving on to the annexation part of this uh, land consideration, the criteria that would be uh, considered about uh, regarding annexation would have to do with whether the land falls in the adopted long-range planning boundary for the city, whether development in the area proposed would fulfill a need, and whether it would be in the city's best interest to be in control of the land as it is annexed into the city. Again, this is the area under consideration, bounded in white. Um, not all of the land in this boundary needs to be annexed. Some, like I said, already is in the city, so this shows the gray area, which would be the land to be annexed into the city. And now whether we look at the uh, previous fringe area agreement or the current fringe area agreement, um, this area uh, doesn't change in its designation as clearly being within the city's identified long-range growth boundary uh, within that growth area identified in our fringe area agreement. So it is an area that's in encouraged to be annexed into the city. Um, as far as identified need, I mentioned previously that there are uh, opportunities for highway adjacent uh, development um, in the city, but they are largely um, rail oriented rather than highway oriented so this would be an identified need and as far as control and being in the city's best interest again going back to that growth area that's identified in the fringe area um, it's best that it develop under city uh, development standards and be uh, provided with city services and to be developed to as highest and best use as possible moving on to the rezoning uh, the third case tonight a rezoning criteria um, this is not an OPD rezoning, so it just has the two basic general criteria. Again, compliance with the comprehensive plan and compatibility with the existing neighborhood. As I mentioned, there was a vote previously successfully for the annexation case and this rezoning. Um, however, due to that failed vote on the comprehensive plan, um, it did need to come back. Um, the revised rezoning as it is proposed tonight does include a couple conditions to ensure that the um, goals and objectives as expressed in the comprehensive comprehensive plan amendment showing that buffer uh, can be truly fulfilled. This is the exhibit showing the rezoning. Um, the two eastern uh, blocks here, the yellowish and the greenish color, are the two that would be uh, requested to be zoned intensive commercial or CI1. Uh, the purple wedge to the left would remain uh, in an interim development uh, zoning district, basically a default zoning district until such time as um, city services could be provided there. So the rezoning is to two zoning districts, the intensive commercial to the east, where um, city services can be provided, and then the interim zoning district to the west. The intensive commercial, or CI1 zone, is intended to provide areas for those uh, for sales and, out, um, sales and service functions and businesses whose operations are typically characterized by outdoor display and storage of merchandise by repair and sales of larger equipment or motor vehicles, 
by outdoor commercial amusement and recreational activities, or by activities or operations conducted in buildings or structures and maybe not completely enclosed. Um, there's a fuller list of what all is allowed here. Again, this is uh, at the top, the things that are permitted by right. So uh, if the zoning were established, these are things that could be permitted um, on day one. But moving down the chart, there are things that are also allowed as provisional uses. They would be allowed uses, but they'd have additional conditions in the code that would be required for them to satisfy. And then finally, the lower category are things that are permitted by special exception with an additional re review by the Board of Adjustment. Um, again, the types of retail trade in this zone are limited in order to provide opportunities for more land-intensive commercial operations. Um, this does show, again, the location on the Southwest District Plan of the proposed uh, comp plan change. If that comp plan change uh, is uh, enacted, this would, of course, be in compliance with that at the time of rezoning. Um, the Southwest District Plan calls for future urban development. Uh, like I said, that was kind of a placeholder. This is definitely intensive commercial development and attractive to it because of its location in adjacent to the street network with a ar major arterial road access. The future expansion of Highway 965 actually is bordered uh, along the west edge of the property here as well. It's also, like I said, adjacent or near to 218, Highway 218. This shows those future arterials uh, there as described. As far as compatibility with the existing neighborhood character that is um, analyzed as part of a rezoning, the subject properties are adjacent to undeveloped farmland to the north, south, and west. A mixture of farmland streams and woodlands can be found throughout these properties. The properties to the south and west contain county agricultural zoning, while the properties to the north contain a split of county residential and city of rural residential uh, zoning. Pre-existing lighter industrial uses can be found along the north side of IWV, as I mentioned, with the County Public Works Facility and the Iowa National Guard Armory. Additional screening and standards uh, are intended to conceal parking, loading areas, and drives from adjacent, adjacent residential. Areas are required by our code. However, staff is also recommending a condition that parking between the principal structure and the IWV Road Southwest and Slathower Road right-of-way is screened to a higher screening standard. In addition, the loading areas and outdoor storage areas may not be located between the front facades of the principal structure and the front yard right-of-way uh, line for both frontages, um, the IWV and Slathower frontages. As I mentioned, the Johnson County poor, poor Farm historic site is immediately east of the subject property. The Poor Farm currently contains farmland um, for the entire stretch of adjacent property across Sloth Hour Road from this property. And the county has expressed a desire and has explored various um, development uh, potential for their property for uh, even potentially future residential dwellings. It's not believed that, the, that this portion of the property will be directly across from the uh, subject property, but still to soften the transition between an intensive commercial future land use to an agricultural one or potentially a residential one to the east on the county property, staff is again proposing a condition that the developer provide a landscape screening buffer. As I mentioned, in the vicinity is the landfill and Highway 965 future alignments. It's anticipated that an intensive commercial use could act as a transition between those uh, very intensive uses in the future and any other uh, future development in this vicinity. Um, just touching quickly on environmentally sensitive areas, the subject property does contain several environmentally sensitive areas along its southern uh, uh, portions, and those areas were evaluated using the city's regulations and our sensitive areas ordinance. Uh, the sensitive areas plan uh, that the applicant has provided does meet the woodland retention requirements and the wetland buffer requirements, and they're not requesting any buffer reductions. Therefore, because there are no impacts to these areas, um, it's not a level two review, it's simply a level one sensitive areas review since they've met all the requirements. Um, this level of review is not considered a type of plan development, therefore no OPD um, proposal was uh, pr uh, submitted with the rezoning, it's just a, re a simple rezoning. And again, as I mentioned, because most of those areas are located along the southern boundary of this property, it really would prohibit kind of naturally any development in that area. Um, just touching quickly on traffic access and street design, um, there is cer certainly sufficient capacity in IWV Road. Actually, it's undergoing some improvements now. 
Um, access to the site will be addressed at site planning. Um, the city has clearly expressed the preference that uh, access to the site be off Sloth Tower to preserve the um, traffic capacity of the Arterial Street IWV. There's also several conditions the staff has proposed um, to address um, both improvements, future improvements to Sloth Tower and contributions by the applicant to future improvements that may be needed and the dedication of right of way to make sure that the city is preserving all of the required right of way for future imp improvements. So to wrap up for the three, three applications, they're highlighted here in the orangish color for the comprehensive plan amendment, the annexation and the rezoning. Um, following these items, if they are successful, there would be future applications for the planning and subdividing the land, um, final sensitive areas review, um, and site plan review for whatever would be proposed to be developed here, as well as building permits. So as I said, there'll be three motions here, so I'll introduce the first one, step away, and come back for the next two as you need them. The first one is the comprehensive plan amendment. Um, Based on the review of relevant criteria, staff did recommend approval of the amendments at its October 21st meeting. By a vote of five to zero, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff's opinion and also recommended approval. They did uh, indeed follow the uh, good neighbor policy for all three of these applications. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions and or come back. Any questions? Dan uh, Danielle, did you mention the width of that buffer zone? I don't recall. Yeah, I'm not sure that I did. It's 350 feet. It would be the, the buffer area along the southern portion. Uh-huh. And I know that it's, you, you don't probably have any clear data or analysis of the land to the south, but the, the natural, the, some of the sensitive areas that we find north of the property line occur on the southern side as well, do they not? So this is the uh, parcel or the subject property. The sensitive areas are what would be included primarily in that 350 foot wide buffer. So areas that would normally be protected from development anyway by the requirement of a buffer around the wetlands or a buffer around the stream or preservation of woodlands, which I don't believe is as much of a control as the streams and um, wetland. Uh, controls. So those would all probably not have been conducive for development in the first place, but they've definitely been reserved through the the form or uh, the comprehensive plan um, designation. Right. I mean, I was I was thinking of the land to the south of the the adjacent property. You know, the northern side of the adjacent. Yeah, property. they didn't have to study that since it's obviously know, not part right, of the application. But, I mean, but right. do, you, do you have a sense of? I mean, it seems to me the the sensitive areas extend into that area. They probably do because of the drainage system yeah. um, include if the property of the south were to develop, they'd have to study their sensitive areas as well, but likely it would um, prohibit development, at least in part, on the, their northern property as well. Danielle, do you know in that area, that 350-foot buffer, is are there a lot of trees in there and or will there be additional tree planting required? I don't believe there really is a much of a woodland component to the sensitive areas. It's a stream corridor, but it's also been farmed. And so um, that is not as much of a, an area maybe on this property, particularly to the west where they haven't proposed development and in the interim development. Uh, that little purple wedge that I was talking about, there might be more of a woodland component there. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? I guess the question is, will there be, and I get with that being a drainage area, there may be some limitations on what kind of tree planting could be right. done. But I'm just thinking about buffer between there and the residential to the south. Um, any sure. trees could certainly help with that. So the, the screening requirements, uh, conditions that I had, did not hit on because those are in the rezoning. That's fine. Notion. If you want to come back to that, that's yeah, okay. they will address uh, the, the planting that's encouraged. But however, it's more of a it's not necessarily a naturalizing effect. It's more of a screen. It's meant to screen, mm -hmm. officially screen. Okay. Any other questions for Danielle? Thank you. I'm, I'm going to open this up to the public to see if they have any comments on this. Please, there is a sign up on the table there. And please come and give your name and your address, please. Welcome. 
Thank you. John Marner with MMS Consultants, 1917 South Gilbert Street, speaking on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I think everything was, was well covered in the staff's presentation. Uh, I would just add a few things. The 350-foot buffer was added, uh, as she mentioned, with the second revision or with the revision that was resubmitted to the PNZ Commission uh, with those additional restrictions. A lot of that area contains the sensitive areas that have been discussed. They're not heavily wooded. There is some woodland areas there. Uh, the areas to the west contain more wetlands and then the stream corridor. Uh, that 350-foot area, and, and in addition to that, as shown on the previous slide, there's two stormwater detention basins provided in that 350-foot buffer area as well. Uh, <clears throat> the total area of the site is just under 80 acres. That 350-foot strip of land that's being proposed as the vegetative uh, buffer between this intense commercial and the residential current county property to the south constitutes just over 21 acres, which is roughly 26% of the developable property. And we feel that's a, a more than adequate, a more than appropriate effort to provide a natural, both a natural buffer and additional buffer with tree plantings. I know that was mentioned as something that would be covered with the rezoning. That is one of the conditions is to plant additional trees for screening along the south property line uh, to help with that screening from this property to the south property. And additionally, it was mentioned during the report that most of the existing commercial and intense commercial properties lie along railroad access. There is some highway access as well. Most of those properties lie in the one to five acre range. There's very few of those types of properties within the city limits or, or within the close city, lim city limits that are in the 10 to 20 acre range uh, that have immediate access or very quick access proximity to the interstate system. This site would provide that. That's a very highly desirable uh, aspect for the types of businesses that would want to be able to utilize this zoning, uh, whatever that use may be, is immediate arterial access and then quick interstate access for larger pieces of property. Uh, I'm available for any other questions. I'll just add in lieu of getting up with the next two. I'm available for questions if, if there are any from council. Thank you. I wanted to just, <laughs> is there anyone else from the, from, from your group that's going to be planning to speak? I think okay. Josh Antler will. Yeah. What I might do is just have um, public commenters maybe just rest a minute so that we can have the, them come up um, before the public comment actually Thank start. Thank you. So you can come up. Welcome. Go ahead. Josh Antler representing IWV Holdings, the uh, owner of the property as well as the applicant. Uh, thank you this evening for your time to, to hear this application and really all three applications. I uh, just wanted to hit a couple of highlights that, that uh, we felt like we heard, uh, received feedback during the planning and zoning process as well as, as coordination with staff, and then some of the pivots that we made uh, according to that feedback. Um, like what was mentioned, the, the buffer, I, I think we need to really step back for a moment and realize 350 feet is longer than the width of a football field and it spans the entire width or the entire breadth of the, the property. So we've got a substantial amount of, of buffer. So that uh, really that was, that was based on a comment that we heard not only in the, the neighborhood meeting but also in the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting that they didn't want any buffer, from, any required buffer from commercial to potential residential to be on the neighboring property. We added that on our property and then solidified it with a, a change in the boundaries for the rezoning as well as the comp plan amendment to make sure that that was solidified and locked in to, uh, to, to really ensure our intent and express our intent to preserve any future developability of the property to the south. Uh, the other thing, um, we can hit on some more stuff probably in the, in the rezoning, uh, but in terms of the comp plan amendment, we feel very, very positive towards intensive commercial. We've heard a lot of interest over time of uh, properties that have direct access or very quick access to, to Highway 218 and then 380 and, and, and Interstate 80. Um, so, so whether we have a user now, which we don't have a, a locked-in user, but any users potentially that, that are transit-oriented 
uh, are in very high demand for properties like this that are that can be very quickly in and out to the interstate and they don't have to tra travel through any neighborhood uh, residential street network so we feel very positive that we'll find a, uh, a user very quickly once this process is wrapped up i'd be happy to answer any questions and i'll come up uh, on the next two hearings as well thank you all right is that everyone from the development team that wants to speak typically i bring up staff and then the development team all right we're going to start public comment at this time thanks for waiting yep. welcome okay uh this relates to this item because it is about the rule the current council's rules on uh, allowing public to speak on here so i'm going to read again now i will expand on the need for having zoom call in public comment at meetings Every single person should have the exact same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case. Contacting y'all by email, phone, or in person out of meeting is not the same as giving public comment at a public meeting. That is a fact. It is unacceptable and discriminatory that the very reasonable accommodation of having hybrid meetings is not available for all public meetings. It is an accommodation that both the Johnson County Board of Supervisors and Iowa City TRC is currently providing. We are still in a pandemic. Currently, people who cannot safely make it to a meeting, who can't, physically, who can't safely physically make it to a meeting, are being discriminated against. People should not have to risk death to participate in this so-called democracy. Even if we weren't still in a pandemic, there are a lot of reasons for people who cannot physically attend meetings, but would still like to and, sh and would be able to if we had accessible meetings. I am a disabled person. I should be able to participate in public meetings when my disability prevents me from being able to physically make it to the meetings. But currently, I can't do that. This council is currently discriminating against me and the entire disabled community. You are telling me and my community that we matter less to this local government than, my able, than our able-bodied neighbors do. I got another minute and 23 seconds. I'm going to do this until you have accessible meetings. So you could like solve this by having accessible meetings. I wouldn't have to do this, but since we currently don't have accessible meetings and you won't commit to making publicly accessible meetings, I'm going to keep doing it. It's unacceptable. It is wrong, morally, completely. You can't excuse it. Just as you decided, change your decision. You were wrong when you decided to not make hybrid meetings. Make them hybrid meetings. Does this annoy you? In, any more comment for comment for council? Uh, yes. Let me think about that. Make it means accessible. I know it's a really wild idea to have accessible government and having accessible functions and not to be ableist, but like, do it. It's really easy. Other entities in this county are doing it. Your, your own city's TRC is doing it. There's no good reason you aren't doing it. So do it. Sign all you want. I don't care. It's not currently accessible and that is wrong. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Nicholas Tyson. Um, again, not going to give you my address. Sorry. So I actually want to address the comprehensive plan directly and specifically with regards to the issue of annexation. So I don't know what y'all are going to say when you have your discussion, but I hope that you will note the similarity between this situation and the Carson Farm situation from a few months back, where Y'all have an interesting tendency to apply your comprehensive plans in completely arbitrary and oftentimes whimsical ways. Now, I know Councillor Mims objected to the way in which the comprehensive plan was being applied at that time and the entire annexation process, and there were a lot of really interesting objections, including you know, the need for the city to increase utilities and so forth. And <laughs> The reason why I bring up specifically the utilities, now I know transit was actually the, the biggest concern that was brought up with the Carson Farm situation, but the reason why the utility situation is interesting is because intensive commercial also has an even more intensive effect on city water, sewer, 
electric, like all utilities. And so the thing is, if you had an objection to the way in which that was going to affect city resources then, do you have the same objections now? I'm curious. I would also like to comment briefly with regards to the situation in which, by the way, as chair, it is entirely at your discretion how public comment is allowed to proceed. In fact, it's not only your discretion how public comment is allowed to proceed, how staff address this council. Basically, you can rule that anyone in this room could speak for seven hours before this council. I mean, I'm not suggesting that you actually do that, but it's entirely up to your discretion. So the thing is, if you're going to, I noticed, I stood right over there as you told us to back off while the developers got to have their say. The clock didn't run when they were talking. The clock doesn't run when staff talk. And yet when it comes to the people who actually have to vote for you, which by the way, I have to admit is not exactly the most delightful thing to have to do. Those people, namely us, we get the little ticking time bomb in front of us. And so the thing is, if you want to actually have equity in this city, equity doesn't just mean having the same 100 or so people who always make all the decisions in this city stand up at this podium and say the same things that they always say. I'm sorry, but when planning comes up here and talks to you about you know, the need for you know, this particular rezoning or this particular change to the comprehensive plan, they're not saying anything they haven't said a million times before, and you are all going to vote for it the same way you always do, except with the strange exception of the Carson Farm situation. So I am genuinely curious, and after I hear your remarks, I will be back up here to comment on those as well. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Um, good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Dan Cobble, and um, I I'm, promise I'm not here to annoy you about things that you, I should be annoying you about, but I'm going to annoy you about something else. Um, so first off, my family is one of the stakeholders um, in this uh, situation. Uh, we, my family owns a little piece of property off out just bordering uh, this uh, zone that they're going to be rezoning. Um, a major concern of residents, uh, I only attended one of the, I was only able to attend one of the neighborhood meetings, but um, my vibe from that was a major concern of the residents has been the lack of transparency, transparency throughout this rezoning process. Um, although my family's land is tiny and only used for our business, many of the other lands are farmland that owners were hoping to turn into development. Um, the impacts of this rezoning and what commercial businesses plan to move into this area is a major concern for them, as the property values will be impacted by this decision. I forget who it was, but during one of the neighborhood meetings uh, held by the city, someone mentioned that for all that we were being told, the developers could be building an adult bookstore. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. But um, my request for the city is this. I think that they should place uh, less emphasis on the needs of developers as exemplified by the fact that you basically gave them an unlimited amount of time to speak while you're giving the residents a, a small window of time to speak. Um, my request is that you prioritize the needs of stakeholders above the needs of the developers. Because, I mean, I don't, how many people here, raise your hand if you're uh, a neighbor or you're here specifically for this issue? All right, how many of you have been, uh, keep, keep them raised, how many of you are happy with the way that this issue has been handled by the city? See? I mean, the city has not been doing a very good job with this issue, and it's not only this issue, I imagine it's all other issues uh, regarding development. I mean, you're not placing, you're not prioritizing the needs of these folks, you're prioritizing the needs of the developers. That needs to change. Um, and... It, it, it's just ridiculous that that this is what it's come down to, that it's about money. You're, I mean, it's. I could go on and on about this, but I'd also like to back up uh, Noah's point about accessibility. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic at this time? And anyone that is interested in speaking, there is a sign up over there, but I'll have you come speak first. And anyone that also wants to speak, you can go ahead and sign in. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name, <clears throat> excuse me, it's hard to talk in this thing. 
Uh, my name is John Bergstrom, and I think many of you uh, received an email from me stating our, our, our position on uh, uh, what's before you tonight. Uh, I'm uh, representing the uh, Slothauer uh, Farms, Slothauer family, that owns the 100 plus acres that abuts uh, the subject property. And, um, you know, I, I guess I simply uh, state that we're here to object uh, to the change in the comprehensive plan and the rezoning that, that goes along with it. And it's, it's for a number of, uh, of reasons, but, uh, uh, you know, the, I, I think we're kind of dancing around uh, what the use is going to be on this land. I, I, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's going to be a Mid-America Energy Service Center. It's going to be on 40 acres. It's intense. It's t intense commercial, and it should not be the cornerstone of an intersection that's going to uh, long-term be residential. All the land to the south. If all the other land's not going to be re residential, let's address it in the comprehensive plan rather than a, a spot zone. I mean, this is this is ridiculous. The land. To the east, the county farm, it, it's under, uh, you know, it's being planned out. All the plans and concepts seem to show agricultural, uh, residential, uh, oh, that's better, uh, residential, uh, educational, and public space. That is not compatible with what's being pro proposed directly adjacent to it. So the, the city, uh, you know, in Ann's presentation, uh, yeah, it showed kind of the character of the area, but it was very limited. It did not show the hundreds of homes that are already in place just to the south of the county farm. So what, what, what's been happening here is the, uh, when we met with staff in the spring, we were told that, because uh, we had an inquiry about a sale, we were said no commercial, uh, there's no commercial market out there in that area, which was fine with us. And we're not against commercial, but we want compatible commercial, and a Mid-America Energy is not that. Thank this, you. Yeah. This Thank is you. spot zoning. Thank you. Let's find something else. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, thank you for hearing me. Uh, I'm Sherry Slothauer Bergstrom, and uh, my family owns the 100 plus acres right to the south of this plot. And just to tell you a little bit about the character of the land in that area, the landowners all around that whole area are 50 plus year owners. And uh, the land is zoned contrary to what you were told in the um, pre presentation tonight by the city. The land is zoned agricultural and residential. And there has been a lot of very nice, expensive uh, residential development within sight of this plot of land. And um, I feel like the buffer has been mentioned a lot tonight too many times, and that's a result of our objections. But it is a diversion, because what we're looking at on this tiny 80-acre plot of land is a lot of lights, a lot of security fencing, a lot of big trucks, and a lot of noise. And um, no amount of trees is going to make a difference in the effect that it has on the people that live in the area. Um, I also wanted to bring up the idea of the spot zoning of this. Spot zoning is illegal in a lot of places. And what spot zoning means is that a small plot of land has their comprehensive plan changed 
to benefit one owner. And that's exactly what's going on in this case. And the effect that it's going to have on the value of our property is massive. We are going to become the buffer between future residential development and uh, this intensive commercial. And so I just implore you to take your time Look at this, do it right. There's a lot of other places in Iowa City that already have commercial and industrial uh, zoning that could be expanded and this could take place. This is an area that you need to visit and look at and see who lives there and see if it's the right thing to be next to the county home with all the plans they have for the future and all the people that live in this area. Thank you very much for listening. And we hope that you really look at this. I felt like the Planning and Zoning Commission Thank you. didn't go out and Thank see you. it. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Kathy Tolan. I live at 965 Slothower Road, one of the few residents that actually live on that road. And I have lived on that road for 25 years <clears throat> plus. Um, there are three houses there. Um, it's very rural. Um, having a commercial intensive property <clears throat> right to, in my backyard actually, um, is very offensive. And I'm sure it's not only offensive to me. Uh, we've got country club estates there. There's many homes in there. These people are gonna be looking at huge lights. Uh, m my opinion, if these big trucks are coming in out on Slathower Road, even though they develop it, they're gonna be going right up and down next to the Johnson County Poor Farm, where all of those people are farming and they have their children there. People walk up and down that road, uh, dozens of them every day, it's, it's from, and that's from Country Club Estates. Um, it just doesn't seem as though it is the appropriate place to have that kind of commercial, intensive commercial, um, even though the improvement of the IWV road is what initially brought this about and apparently some future talks are, that were taking place at the beginning of the year, which none of us knew about. I live probably 600 feet from where this is going to happen or where it is proposed to happen. And I honestly have never even gotten a letter from zoning or anyone in conjunction to this. It was the Slothowers, which I bought their parents' farm house, that notified me and said, hey, you know, did you know this was going on? I said, no, I had no idea. And I still to this day have had no notification from anyone. I don't know if you guys notified people within 300 feet, I believe, is all you have to notify as far as this is concerned. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of residents out there. There's Country Club Estates, there's Galloway Hills, there's Walnut Ridge, you've got Chatham Oaks, you've got the Melrose Apartments for the people that are developmentally disabled or having some other types of issues. Um, there's many residential people out there that this is going to affect traffic already just because of the landfill as you if just sit out there someday look at the traffic in the morning and in the afternoon look at the traffic already turning on to the interstate look at the traffic turning off of the interstate going into the university to work or wherever they work in town so this is just going to thank you add a lot more to it thank, thank you, you. Welcome. Hello again, Mayor, Council. Please, Please Google the name Edward Gardner, G-A-R-D-N-E-R, -E Chicago. Mr. Gardner used to bother me as a 15-year-old because you give he was your persnickety. Name again and oh, I apologize. Address. D O Y L E L A N D is in David R Y. 
positive vision communications. As I was saying, Mr. Gardner used to bother me as a 15-year-old me working at McDonald's illegally. I lied about my age. And he used to talk about character. Three years later, Mr. Gardner handed me a check. It was for five comma zero zero zero. No application needed because he sent me to college. Mr. Gardner is the founder and former owner of Soft Sheen Products, an African American business owner. Fast forward to 2012 in Evergreen Park, Illinois. Mr. Gardner by himself got up, got up, traveled to Evergreen Park and stood in the path of construction and said, I dare you, by himself. No media, no entourage, by himself. And that embarrassed Chicago because Evergreen Park, which sits on the border of Chicago, had decided we're going to extract profit from Chicago by clearing off land for profit gained by African Americans. What does that have to do with Iowa City? The very thing that I brought up earlier. Where are the African American construction firm, planning design, you get the point. Because we keep talking about what matters, but what matters most is equity as it relates to dollars. Think about it. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one. All right. Um, before I close, oh, oh sorry. yes. Welcome. Hi. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, I've lived in Iowa City all my life, and this is my first council meeting, and I have to say that I admire the work that you do. It, it, it's um, long and hard listening to all these comments, but um, I want to comment on um, the sloth hour um, rezoning. Um, I am a sloth hour also now in Anderson. Um, I grew up in that area, um, and if you think about it, and if you drive out there, it just does not make sense for that area. It is very flat out there, and if you drive like into um, the Country Club Estates development and drive to the back of it and look over to that area, it's just a straight shot as far as what you would see over there in that corner. So no matter what kind of buffer zone you put in, it's still going to affect the value of those properties and the properties that we own, the 180 acres that we own. Um, so you really have to really think about what the whole future of that area is. Because if you do this spot zoning that you're talking about for this development, and then you keep our 180 acres that's to the south, residential agricultural, what does that do to our property, which is actually even closer to that country club estates? So it's really important that you look at the big picture and not just what is important for that corner. And um, there is also a lot of traffic that goes through there through the university and things like that. So I just don't want you to make a, a hasty decision. I want you to think about it. I want you to drive out there. Um, there's a lot, that county home, there's a lot of beautiful plans for out there where potentially people go out there, visit there, and then right across the road would be this Mid-America site. It just doesn't seem to fit. So just thank you for listening, and please take it into consideration, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to close the public hearing, but before I do that, I just want to make sure um, from council if the majority are in, uh, inclined to vote 
in favor of this. Yeah, it, actually, the the second two that's required, but not for this first item because it's a comp plan okay. amendment. Right. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So, so moved. moved, Thomas. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Burgess. Council discussion. I have a couple of questions of staff, if I could. <clears throat> Is that right? Questions about um, is some of the local people have brought up lighting, uh, fencing, um, some of those issues. What is what is allowed? What is required um, on an intensive commercial commercial property? Trying to get a better sense of the impact on the local residents. Sure, I don't have the standards with me since those are site plan elements. Um, those types of things would be reviewed at that point. I can tell you our code does have a lighting standard in it that has limits on lumens, uh, brightness of the lighting and uh, where it, how bright it can be at the property line. Uh, it has to come down quite a bit by the time it hits the property line of where the on-site lighting is occurring. So that's not to say you wouldn't see sky glow or that there you wouldn't notice there's an additional use in the neighborhood that has lights, um, but the standards are meant for not light not to trespass as measured at ground level at the property line of the development. Okay. Do you know offhand the fencing either requirements and or limitations? We don't generally require fencing. If there was a hazard that needed to be fenced, uh, either a fall hazard or something like that, our, our codes might require it. It's more typical that the user would want to protect their property by putting up a fence to keep trespassers out or that their, their storage of materials to remain on site. Um, so if fencing, if it's used in those ways, has height limits on it, um, things like that, but it's not a requirement necessarily we would impose. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, council discussion. Well, I was grateful to see the, the, the discussion at planning and zoning kind of between the two meetings and the changes that were made. Um, I, I hear the area residents' concerns and understand them. This is a more rural setting and certainly the idea of what you know, you might see in the farther distance is, is I think maybe more top of mind than if you're in an urban environment to begin with. But I think that this buffer distance is really significant. And the other, um, the Country Club Estates that was mentioned and the other homes are quite a distance away from this. Um, even, well, and, and so my, my home is about, it's about a 60 foot wide lot. And so 600 feet away would be 10 lots away. And if I stand in the street, you know, I think I'd have a hard time kind of understanding what might be going on that far away. Um, and I'm very close to a heavy industrial area, which is the Procter and Gamble plant, you know, probably closer than, than that distance as well. So I'm just thinking in my own mind of, what that impact might be like. And I'm, I'm reminded of some, a helpful uh, phrase that was brought to us recently or reminded to us recently, which is an individual's property rights don't extend beyond the boundaries of the property. And it's hard when something that may be near you is not something that you would desire to be there. But we really do have to balance um, other property owners as well. And so I, I'm favorable to this comprehensive plan amendment based on the changes that have been made in the what's been presented in this version. Yeah, I appreciate the comments um, by the residents, and and as I've, you know, looked through and read through it, the other, the other comparison in some ways when we look at these is, is the number of houses that are built. Um, amazingly close to the interstate, as I as lo when I look at Interstate 80, um, and I mean I hear that all the time from where I live. I, I think a lot of the traffic here that has been mentioned is really is going to be headed east on Melrose, 
um, when people talk about the university and things like that. Anything coming off from 218, you know, for the universities going east is not going to be impacting this out there. I do think that 350 foot buffer um, is significant. Um, when we get to that rezoning, I, I want to see more about what might be required in terms of additional tree planting. I realize it's kind of water, creaky water area, so I'm not sure how much um, can actually be done there. Um, I, I'm concerned, you know, as I looked at this and looked at the staff report of, and it was mentioned tonight by developers in terms of the limited amount of uh, sites in the city for um, this kind of development and the small size of those lots. And a lot of that is on the southeast side where rail is an important component and having um, some of that development in other parts of the community and and adjacent basically to the interstate or very very close to the interstate so um, while I understand um, that it's not ideal I think that this can work in this area and I will be supporting it it seems to me one of the critical issues here is the the question of the buffer you know we've we've heard about heard it described as a vegetative noise and site buffer um, I do agree that 350 feet seems like a, a significant amount of area in which to establish that noise and uh, site buffer um, but the the, the screening specifications that we have in our zoning code in my view um, you know and we're we've been talking about form-based code at council are standards which are really in my mind more developed for urban situations rather than rural situations which I think is that's that's kind of the character and context of this project and and with that in mind it seems to me the buffer needs to have the robustness that one would find with a, a rural buffer as opposed to perhaps what you might see oh just off the top of my head along the edge of a hy supermarket um, but it's hard to understand what exactly needs to be done in my mind because we're, we're talking about a you know an, at this point the um, comprehensive plan cha change and then annexation and rezoning um, what it, what exactly it is we're trying to buffer we just don't know so my my concern would be having the assurance that when a project actually is being proposed under the any change in rezoning that we would be able to meet the noise and site buffer intention that we are discussing tonight um, i mean i do think if if there is a robust enough and substantial enough buffer i do think the impacts of whatever is done there uh, should be able to be mitigated but I, I just want to pose that concern and and how we might be able to address it as we move forward i think this is this is an area of the of growth for the city ultimately I mean we did not we did uh, the a majority of council um, didn't voted down the annexation of Carson Farms I voted I voted to annex Carson Farms I think that area is probably d directly adjacent to this when when we talk about development there's going to be a sewer trunk going underneath 218 um, in the in the near future to to facilitate development uh, of the city on the other side of 218 um, you know I think that we that we I live all not all that far from there someone mentioned Galway Hills I live in Galway Hills um, I hear the interstate all the time I, I smell the landfill quite often um, and it's part of what I bought into um, for, for better or for worse I mean I think we have that um, realistically um, there's the talk about the buffer but also realistically when we look at the other some of the other intensive uses that haven't really been mentioned very much such as the National Guard Armory and so forth already out in the area that 
this would be this would be adjacent to um, that um, that there there can be enough mitigation. I also talked to people. I also talked to supervisors. Asked if the county had specific concerns uh, because of the poor farm, uh, and they said no. So I will be supporting it. I guess for me on this on this uh, project, when I look at the the amendments that will uh, be required to you know make this happen. Um, of course, you know, I looked at some of the things that have happened in the past uh, with things that have been presented to council. Um, but I also have to balance where are we growing um, in the city and how do we do that? Um, it's been mentioned that mid-American, um, you know, would be potentially uh, nothing to sign to my knowledge. Um, we'll have a project out there. I think what's going to be important, um, should this be passed, is when whatever proposed project come forth, that we do pay attention to some of the concerns that have been brought up by residents to the best of our ability. Um, it is never, it's always a challenge when you're the neighbor to something new moving in. Um, that is not identical or similar to where you live or what, what you live in. And so I, I do understand that this is kind of a challenge for some people that live there. Um, totally get it. I understand. I empathize with you, honestly. Um, I do think that given all of, we don't really, we don't really know what's going to go there. Um, but I do think that if it is mid-American, you know, when I look at where, where else in the city, I do think that this would be appropriate out there, and so I will support it. This has uh, been kind of a difficult decision for me because I've wavered both ways here. Listening to the residents, I really do appreciate um, hearing from from you all and and can understand what you'd anticipated and and have been used to in that area. Uh, but I think as the mayor pointed out, um, we are kind of growing uh, small on where we can develop and especially develop these kinds of areas uh, in Iowa City. And it, uh, from what I've heard, there is a need. If it is potentially going to be Ben American, there is a need for that. And it already does exist on, on the eastern edge of town there, just off of uh, Muscatine Road. Uh, we haven't ever heard any complaints. I don't know, Jeff can maybe help me out with this, from, from residents around that area as far as noise or light or the, the traffic. So I'm, I'm hoping that those kinds of concerns maybe uh, would be resolved. There wouldn't be such, such an issue with that. Um, it, it just sounds like it's um, a good spot for this development to be. It doesn't look as though to me, I've driven by there a number of times, you, the residential would be there. I just can't envision homes being there in that area. Uh, but I could see something like this, as I think um, Councillor Weiner stated with the highway um, construction uh, vehicles across the way and the National Guard across the way, it seems more well suited to this kind of development than to anything residential. So I would be supportive at this time. I really appreciate everyone came here today to comment. Uh, this is hard. I always, you know, try to hear the resident concern and figure out the ways to solve their problem. But we knew this is coming, and uh, this area is city growth area, and I think uh, if it's going to be mid America, mid America was here in the middle of the, you know, residential and a lot of area, and not a lot of people was complaining. So uh, I really, it's hard, but I'm going to be approving this. Thank you. Any other comments by council? Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. 
Item 11B, Annexation, IVW Road Southwest. Resolution to annex approximately 70.39 acres of land located west of the intersection of IWV oh, Road Southwest and Slothour Road. I'm going to open the public hearing. And welcome again. Thank you, Mayor. As I said, I presented earlier on this, so I'll just move to the motion and the recommendation. Uh, based again on a review of the relevant criteria, staff did recommend approval of the proposed annexation. At September 16th, 2021 meeting of, by a vote of five to zero, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff's opinion and also recommended approval of annexation. Um, that is it. I'm happy to answer questions about the annexation if you have any more at this point. Any questions? So uh, annexation is, is voluntary, correct? This is a voluntary annexation. And before I go to the public, is there any anyone from the developer that have anything to add to this? Thank you. Uh, not a lot to add for the annexation. I'll, I'll maybe come back and add a couple things with the rezoning. Uh, again, this is a voluntary annexation. Some of the concerns that have been addressed, I think, uh, in your discussion addressed, answered some of the things that I was going to uh, come up and, and mention as well. The traffic uh, that already existed with the armory and with the Joint Communications Center on that property. Uh, it's a natural expansion area. Uh, one other item I will add, <clears throat> the sanitary sewer that would be necessary to provide service to this property uh, would be extended from its current location uh, to the east, it's about 600, I believe six to 700 feet to the east of the property of Sloth Hour Road. It would be extended across the, the length of, of uh, IWV to the west, almost to the stream corridor uh, by the developer at the cost of the developer. And I'm available for any questions if you have any. Thank you. All right, no more comments from the developer, great. I'm gonna open up the public hearing at this point. And I'll ask um, you to sign in and give your name and your address. Welcome. All right. Hello, it's me, Noah, again. Um, this relates to this item because it's about the uh, your rules about not allowing public comment uh, accessibility. Okay, so I'm going to read this once again. Now, I will expand on the need for having Zoom call in public comment at all meetings. Every single person should have the exact same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case. Contacting y'all by email, phone, or in person is not the same as giving public comment at a so-called public meeting. That is a fact. It is unacceptable and discriminatory that the very reasonable accommodation of having hybrid meetings is not currently available for all so-called public meetings in this, of this council. It is an accommodation that the count Johnson County Board of Supervisors and Iowa City TRC is currently providing. We are still in a pandemic. Currently, people who cannot safely make it to a meeting are being discriminated against. People should not have to risk death to participate in this so-called democracy. Even if we weren't still in a pandemic, there are a lot of reasons people cannot physically attend meetings, but would still like to and would be able to if meetings were truly accessible. I am a disabled person. I should be able to participate in public meetings when my disability prevents me from being able to physically make it to a meeting. But currently, I cannot do that because this council is currently discriminating against me and the entire disabled community. You are telling me and the disabled community that, that we matter less than our able-bodied neighbors. So, Bruce, are you going to you know, change the rules and have accessible meetings or no? Any other comment? Yes, have accessible meetings. It's very easy. It's happening within its own city's commissions. I know y'all don't care about the CRC, <coughs> clearly, but they're providing it, and that's, you have the equipment, you have the technological ability, you're just choosing not to. You'll make rules for developers, like he has said, Make sexual accommodations for those, but can't make accommodations for disabled people. 
How is that okay? Where's the social justice in that? You, one of your seven strategic priorities is to have and encourage community engagement. You know how you could encourage community engagement? Have hybrid meetings. Yep. Very easy. Thank you. Like and there's no good anything, reason. Any other comments? Yeah. Make your meetings accessible. Please make meetings accessible. Make your meetings accessible. I'll sing a song. That was a little, little ditty for y'all. Make your meetings accessible. Make them accessible. That's all. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. Uh, good evening again, Council. Um, Nicholas Tyson, as before. Um, same sitch. Not going to give you my address. So, um, first of all, Councillor Taylor, um, the Mid American facility is off of Lower Muscatine Road, not Muscatine Road, but it's easy oversight. But it's worth noting that that facility is actually sandwiched in a bunch of other commercial and light industrial. It's not just in, like, plopped down in the middle of nowhere. To the south of it is Sycamore Mall. To the east of it is, well, to the sort of east-ish of it is Kirkwood. And also to, directly to the east of it is a P&G facility. And then on the other side of First Avenue, which is on the, well, then you have Tate High School, and then you have First Avenue, and then you have more commercial. So the thing is that entire zone is actually already commercial. And regardless of buffer sizes and all that newbie crap, frankly, I don't care. But the, the real serious question here, and the reason why I save this specifically for the annexation, is because when annexations have come up in the past, this council has always, at least until tonight, address the issue of, well, we need to seriously talk about what we're doing with annexations and specifically how it relates to housing. As several people who came up here noted, this, is current, this land is currently <clears throat> zoned agricultural residential. And in the past, you have had pro uh, plans come before you that have included residential. So then the question is, do you actually have a long-term vision of how you're going to integrate residential into this area? You've said that this is a growth area for the city. Yeah, I mean, it's in the buffer zone. Obviously, it is. Sorry, not the buffer zone. It's, it's in the, <clears throat> I forget what it's called, the agreement zone between the county and, anyway. The point is, because you have always failed to have that ultimate conversation about what you're doing with annexation, how it relates to housing, and what you refer to as affordable housing, whatever that means, you keep doing things like this, where a developer comes to you with, any old proposal, and then you think, you think of it solely in terms of itself. You, look, you say, this thing seems fine as it is by itself. The problem is you're talking about a part of the city that hasn't really been fleshed out yet. When you talk about the Mid-American facility on the, south, on the east side of town off Lower Muscatine, like, that is a part of the town that has already been fleshed out. Like, where its residential is located is already been located. Where its commercial is located has already been located. Where the schools are already been located. But when you're talking about that part of town, you actually have to have a broader vision of what you're going to be doing with the entire area. And so that, in that context, the spot zoning is a very serious issue because you're making these haphazard decisions based upon, well, frankly, arbitrary justifications that you come up with in the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Welcome. Thank you again. <clears throat> he actually uh, makes very good points. If you're going to change a document that a ruling document uh, that affects a large area, you don't do it for an 80 acre piece. And you know, as far as our land, we just wanna know what we're going to be able to do with it. And you're, you're restricting us now by placing, and yes it is, Mid-America Energy. Uh, by placing them there, it's, it's gonna have a, a large effect on us but a lot of other people. So if you're gonna change the comprehensive plan, look at a much wider area. I include us, include other, other landowners. We, we wanna know. So I asked the city uh, in the plan, uh, city plan planner, 
you know, okay, if you're going to do this, what are you going to do with the land surrounding it? And the answer was, we're not looking at any other parcel. That's, that's crazy. That's, that's not responsible. And if you're going to put a commercial use on that corner, make it compatible with what, what else is planned for out there. Uh, a 40 acre, frankly, in industrial use just is not compatible for what's there or what should be there in the future. So, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic before I close the public hearing? All right, before I close the public hearing, I'm going to ask council if they're inclined to vote with PNZ. I'm seeing the majority. Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved, so Thomas. Second, sorry. All right, council discussion. Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. We are on to item number 11C, which is rezoning IVW Road Southwest. Ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 53.36 acres from county agricultural to intensive commercial approximately 17.03 acres from county agriculture to interim development commercial, and approximately nine acres from rural residential to intensive commercial for land located west of the intersection of IVW, IWV, Road Southwest, Slough Hour Road. I'm gonna open the public hearing and welcome Danielle again. Thank you, Mayor. Again, I'll just move to the <coughs> recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Commission on this one. Based on a review of the relevant criteria, staff did recommend approval of the proposed rezoning with conditions, which I'll walk you through here in a moment. At its October 21st meeting, by a vote of 5-0, to zero, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff's opinion and also recommended approval of the rezoning with the same staff recommended conditions. The CZA has been signed by the applicant for this one. So these are the conditions that were uh, included with this. I mentioned them uh, kind of briefly in my presentation. I'll kind of refresh your memory again. Um, the conditions include platting the property um, because we need the zoning boundary districts to follow lot lines, which they're not currently established yet. So they will be kind of the final uh, component of establishing the exact location of the rezonings. Um, the plat does need to show that buffer e easement area, 350 feet wide as uh, embodied in those comp plan amendments that were made. The area is to be planted to an F S3 standard, which I can tell you more about if you want to know uh, what the S3 standard is. It's nearly the highest standard of screening that our code does include. Um, it's intended to be uh, a buffer treatment that uses dense landscape screening to provide a visual and physical separation between uses and zones. It's commonly applied between residential uses and commercial and industrial uses to screen outdoor work or storage areas. It has required materials including shrubs and small evergreens to form a continuous screen or hedge at least five feet to six feet in height and more than 50% solid year round. Um, screening materials must be at least three feet in height when planted. At least half the shows must be evergreen varieties. Um, included in our uh, CZA and the conditions here is uh, in the mixture of deciduous and evergreens and that they have to be at least 30 feet tall upon maturity. Um, also that the plant needs to include dedication of right of way along Sloth Hour Road frontage. Um, as determined by the city engineer to allow for that uh, road section to be improved eventually as needed to city urban design standards. With the final plan approval, um, the owner also has to execute a subdivider's agreement addressing uh, the, con the conditions related to road improvements, including a, a financial contribution to the cost of upgrading Slothower Road, um, the installation of an S3 screen, as I just mentioned, along Slothower to buffer the um, property to the east, the uh, Johnson County Poor Farm, and improvements to Slathar Road to the extent to the south of whether, whatever uh, future access uh, occurs off of Slathower. And then finally, for all lots fronting IWV and Slathower, the loading areas and outdoor storage areas shall not be located between the front facade of the principal structure and the building right-of-way line. 
So those are the conditions uh, attached with this rezoning. I'm happy to answer questions about those if you have any. Thank you. All right. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and call on public comments at this time. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot your own special rule. Please. I'm to cede my time and wait until no, we. No, go ahead. I'll just add a, a couple of very brief notes. Um, I know there's been some concerns about the spot referred to as spot zoning. It's 80 acres. It's a very large piece of property. Uh, a lot of the concern or, or issues that arise with spot zoning tend to address individual lots within an already developed part of town and they're they're meant to protect those existing residents in highly developed parts of town from small areas of, of property being zoned to something that's not compatible with the adjacent uses this is a much larger piece of property uh, than than something of that nature additionally that subject came up during the pnz commission's meeting they all, uh, uh, I believe a couple of the commission members mentioned the fact that during their review process and as during our review process as well and staffs, I believe, they did take a look at the entire area and they did feel that this commercial use is complementary in the big picture as it pertains to the immediate area along IWV and the area farther to the south. It's approximately a half a mile away, Country Club Estates and those properties adjacent to Rarit Road. Again, I'm available for any questions if you have any. Thank you. All right, public comment. Public hearing is open. Welcome. Uh, good evening again, Nicholas Tyson. Again, same stitch as before, not going to dox myself. So it's interesting to me that you guys didn't have anything to say about the annexation for all the reasons that I enumerated before. So, OK. The previous speaker noted that when this went before PNZ, that there was an evaluation that was performed with regard to the bigger picture. The problem is no one actually knows what the bigger picture is precisely because this council isn't doing the job of figuring out what that is. Because you have your comprehensive plans, but again, you change them willy-nilly to accommodate whatever individual proposals happen to come before you. In other words, the work that P and Z does, or rather they should have done to make sure that this <laughs> conforms to the comprehensive plan, they didn't do. And now you're not doing it. So the issue here with this particular rezoning is actually the same as with the annexation. They're related, they're fundamentally similar things, which is that I already know that you're going to approve this because you always approve these things with rare, rare exceptions. But the issue is you still make these decisions without actually having had the conversation about what that bigger picture is supposed to be. So whenever evaluations are performed at the commission or the board level, they have to guess what that bigger picture is. And that is precisely what P&Z has done here. They have guessed what is going to happen. Now, if you had clear intentions for what this land is ultimately going to be used for, and that was supposedly to be communicated in the comprehensive plan, then it would be less of an issue. The problem is the comprehensive plan ends up being more of a suggestion rather than a rule because you can change it willy-nilly, which, you know, is your right as counsel. You are elected representatives. You can do that's perfectly legal but the fundamental issue is for the city that as it grows west as it grows south as it grows east and even as it grows a little north you all don't actually have a clear conception of what the city is going to look like in the future what its housing needs are what its commercial needs are even what its industrial needs might be such as they are and since you refuse to have that conversation every single time these issues come up I have to sit generally there or sometimes online and listen to you meander around the topic rather than actually address it. And as the mayor, and also the city manager could do this as well, Jeff, you could do it too. You could put items on your work session agendas to finally tackle these issues. 
But when it comes to these larger, broader concerns about housing, about what kind of commercial is important for that housing, I mean, you talk about again and again and again about the form-based code in the South District. I mean, that's nice, but the thing is, like, you need to be doing the same thing for the rest of the city as well. And you really shouldn't be making these sweeping changes without doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Uh, Noah, as you know, um, is this on? Okay. I hear it now. Um, so, yeah, seconding what last speaker said, he said a lot better than I ever could. Uh, so I'm going to read this statement once again. Hopefully, you will, hopefully it will sink in this time. Now, I will expand on the need for having Zoom call in public comment at meetings. Every single person should have the same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case. Contacting y'all by email, phone, or in person is not the same as giving public comment at a public meeting. That is a fact. It is unacceptable and discriminatory that the very reasonable accommodation of having hybrid meetings is not available for all public meetings. It is the combination that the Johnson County Board of Supervisors and IC, Iowa City TRC are currently providing, so proves that y'all could be doing that. Uh, we are still in a pandemic. We currently have people who cannot safely make it to, to a meeting physically. They are being discriminated against. People should not have to risk death to participate in this so-called democracy. Even if we weren't still in a the pandemic, there are a lot of reasons for people to not uh, disabled and able to not be able to physically attend meetings, but would still like to and should still be able to be able to make those send meetings. Sorry, I got lost a little bit. Okay, um, I'm a disabled person. I should be able to participate in public meetings when my disability prevents me from being able to physically make it to meetings, but currently I can't do that. This council is currently discriminating against me and the entire disabled community. You're telling me and my community that we matter less to you because we are not able-bodied. Stop your ableism. It's easy. You could do it. You could say something right now saying, okay, we're going to have high meetings from now on. It's up to you, Bruce. He's like, you make the rules and all that stuff, so do it. Are you going to do it? Anyone else want to speak up? Any other comments relating to the rezoning of the IWV Road Southwest? Yes. And they are what people comment on these who can't physically make it to meetings. Janice, this is your chance to speak up about this since you claim you're going to try and make me accessible, so do so publicly. Since none of you else have committed to that besides you on Twitter. Janice, I'm referring to you, just to make that clear. Any other item related to this? Yeah, I'd like to have meetings accessible and stop having an ableist council. Thank you. You're not welcome this time. Thank you. Welcome. Sherry Slothauer Bergstrom again, and I won't take up very much of your time. I'm just extremely disheartened and sad about not only what the decision was, but the way I see our city government operating and, um, you know, decisions being made without input until it's too late. And um, I hope that, I, I just want to echo what the other speakers had said, that we would really like to sell our land. Our parents have passed away. It's an area where this is happening a lot. Uh, it's, there's going to be a big turnover. It's a lot of older people, and um, it's time to look at the whole area if you're going to do something like this. And... Um, if we put our land up for sale now like we had planned, that's why we had called the city staff in the spring and we were told there was nothing on the horizon. There was gonna be no change and so that's, the, that's what we've been dealing with. And, and to sit out here and not be able to, when we hear wrong information or when we look at stilted uh, presentations that 
go you know toward what the developer wants and you can't say anything is so disheartening but um, anyway we're going to probably be putting our land up for sale and we don't know what it is now you know we don't know who we're looking at or what's going to happen so please please look at the larger area and figure out what you're going to do out there and um, it, it's affecting a lot of people even though that's not what you've been led to believe um, the pictures don't show anything other than what they want you to sh see so um, thank you for listening to us and um, I hope that the whole thing can come to good in the end thank you I thought I was done too, but this will be quick too. I just want to refute spot zoning relates to a single user, and this is what it is. And when we talk a much larger area, I'm not talking our land. I'm talking the land to the north, the land to the east, the land to the south, and you are you are so focused on accommodating this one user, you're ignoring a much much bigger picture take a look you know uh, if you want to amend the comprehensive plan do it but do it with thought and care and and make it encompassing so thank you thank you anyone from the public like to address this topic okay um I'm going to just ask council before I close the public hearing, are they inclined to vote in accordance with PNZ? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to give first consideration, please? So moved. Todd. Second, Thomas. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Oh, wait. We're going to have discussion. Is anyone going to? It's not. It's not 100% directly on topic, but uh, but I really do take the points of our need to take a really a, a thorough look at the comprehensive plan and figure out what we want this whole area to look like. I mean, I'm going to vote yes tonight, but I think that we need that. I think as a council, it's really incumbent upon us to to take a look at the big picture and make some decisions. Yeah, I um, you know I think one of the factors that are driving uh you know our land use policies here is 218 and the interchange here so that's that's creating kind of a unique corridor if you will um in what is essentially a rural landscape and um you know i share the concerns of the the residents and and uh landholders in this area of what exactly is the vision um, you know, we're, we've been moving more to a form-based code, if you're familiar with these terms, from our conventional coding, which is more driven by use, but that doesn't apply here. We, we're, st we're still in kind of our conventional zoning categories. Uh, form-based coding pays more attention to the relationship of land use to, you know, land uses to one another and promotes um, mixing the uses. It's less exclusionary in terms of that interface but it, it does it is mindful of how they interface and um, you know I think staff and some of their suggestions are in effect inserting some of those qualities that you would see in a form based code with respect to the the streetscape on IWV which I just learned what that stood for the other day I finally found a source for what that stands for um, so the, you know, the frontages, in other words, are important. How, how do the frontages and the relationship of, of the land in question relate to the context? Um, so we have the frontages issues along IWV and, uh, you know, the road there to the, to the east, and then the, the properties to the south. And, you know, I've been trying to emphasize how I feel uh, uh, the, the 
what we refer to as the vegetated, vegetative noise and site buffer are you know, critical, particularly to the south. Uh, it seems to me there are conditions both on the property in question and on the property to the south that will lend themselves to creating a, you know, a strong vegetated buffer. But uh, you know, there, we don't have assurances that questions of particularly site, in my view, are going to be satisfactorily um, achieved through the S3 standard. So I, I guess what I would, I would be asking is that as this goes to, excuse me, to a, um, you know, an actual project that staff pay very close attention uh, to the, in a sense, what I consider to be the performative aspects of this, you know, that we're, we're looking for a noise and site buffer. What do we need to do to achieve that? It may be that the S3 standard is not in itself sufficient to achieve that, that level of buffering uh, and that the site plan be developed to ensure that it does. If I could just provide some commentary um, to, to wrap things up here. I, I think one thing that uh, is important to note for the council and the public you know, the properties, uh, the subject properties tonight um, have very different characteristics than, than nearby properties to the south that have been res uh, um, uh, referenced, particularly when it comes to their developability. Uh, currently, Slothauer is an unimproved road. Um, and when we talk about, you know, you'll be getting into budget in another month. Um, I don't think you've ever heard us talk about um, the timeline for improving Slothauer. It's not currently what we would consider an on the radar project in terms of the city taking initiative to, to fully improve Sloth Hour, which would be needed for development uh, to the south there. Um, and there hasn't been a whole lot of uh, discussion tonight regarding the, the nearby landfill, probably close to 200, 250 acres. Uh, clearly there's gonna be uh, continued pressure to grow that landfill, which will have significant um, compatibility um, uh, implications for nearby properties, particularly those to the south uh, that, that are directly adjacent uh, to this landfill. And then lastly, utility uh, characteristics are much different up on the IWV road um, uh, corridor as they would be to the south. And the properties there to the south are not immediately serviceable by municipal utilities. So the kind of the development readiness of these properties are drastically different and they have some um, uh, more significant challenges as you move away from the subject property. So they may be adjacent, but there's a lot of differences between those. Um, just wanted to point that out as you wrap up your discussion tonight as, as we start to think longer term about this, this area. Any other comments? Roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. <coughs> Item 11D, rezoning east of South Riverside Drive and north of McAllister Boulevard. Ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 5.81 acres a property located east of South Riverside Drive and north of McAllister Boulevard from high density single family residential to high density single family residential with planned development overlay. And I'm gonna open the public hearing. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Again, Daniel Sisman, Neighborhood and Development Services. This application is for rezoning of the area highlighted in white here. It's approximately uh, six, five or six acres. I'm sorry, 5.81 acres uh, of land uh, located north of McAllister. It's adjacent to property owned by the city along the Iowa River. Um, this is a rezoning to an OPD zoning designation. The property had previously gone through this process in 2015 to establish an OPD RS-12. However, the OPD doesn't have a does have an expiration date and it has expired. So in order to continue development into a manufactured uh, 
housing park, the OPD needs to be reestablished. OPDs are required by our zoning code for manufactured housing parks because they're a type of alternate ownership, a little bit different than typical development in that one owner generally owns all of the land and then leases lots out to people that own the, just the dwelling that are, lo that are located on the land. So because of that alternate ownership, um, there's often private infrastructure involved, streets, uh, water and sewer connections, shared facilities, and provision of services like trash privately. So again, it's a little bit different than typical development and requires an OPD so that a glimpse of the, the site planning can be obtained early in the, the process. Um, the surrounding uh, area is an existing manufactured home park, which was created in the mid-1970s, containing 55 units. Um, the rezoning would allow for the development of an additional 35 manufactured homes uh, in the area, extending out another phase of this uh, manufactured housing community. Um, <clears throat> This shows the existing zoning, as I mentioned, the OPD that has expired and the city parcel to the east. This is a glimpse, like I said, of that uh, more of a site plan level detail that we would not normally see with the rezoning, but because of the OPD you do, showing that next phase of development, showing a connection of a loop street, a private loop street, to an existing uh, roadway uh, that connects eventually to the private street, which is South Riverside Drive. Because this is an OPD rezoning, there are the two standard uh, criteria as well as several more that are evaluated. Um, the primary ones being consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, this is in the South Central District plan and it does note that residential uses should be phased out of this area. However, the city has made improvements to McCallister Boulevard recently and extended um, south um, uh, extended south along the south edge of the property and also in, uh, developed a levee uh, in this area in 2013. Um, the Iowa City 2030 comprehensive plan goals also state that a need, there is a need for affordable housing, especially in areas with good access to parks like the nearby Terry Trueblood and other amenities. Because of that, this property, uh, and because uh, this property is maintaining the existing use, essentially extending a phase, uh, provides a relatively affordable housing alternative and has good access to the street network, trails, and open space, staff does support um, uh, this rezoning tonight and finds that it is in, in conformance with the comprehensive plan's goals. Um, as far as compatibility with the existing neighborhood, again, I mentioned this is an existing uh, development and it's a, another phase of that, extending that out and developing some vacant land into similar use. As far as the OPD, we'll walk through the um, criteria for that here, starting with land uses. Um, the density for this proposal, this is single family manufactured housing. It's an allowable type and does meet the density uh, limitations of this particular zone. I'm talking about design, um, the RS-12 zone requires a min minimum building width of 20 feet. The applicant is requesting a waiver from that under the OPD process to reduce that to 14 feet. That is in line with the existing manufactured housing stock. Um, it would allow for development of underutilized land, like I've mentioned, this final phase of development. And the configurations of lots and layouts of the internal street ne network will be similar to the existing neighborhood and the neighborhoods to the west of that. Um, in addition to that, the proposed homes will be well within the allowable bulk dimensions for this zoning district. Um, as far as open space, I mentioned the city-owned parcel to the east. That was acquired uh, in lieu of this development providing um, public open space in the future, so their public open space criteria has already been met. Um, however, there's also private open space that our code requires on a lot by lot basis, or in this case, a lease lot by lease lot basis. Um, the applicant is actually requesting to waive uh, some component of that um, private or the on site open space, and therefore, staff is requesting um, additional semi public op uh, open space be uh, required as a condition through the development of a, a park, a play, a play area within the development. So as far as what that waiver entails, um, this shows, oh, I'm sorry, we've lost the notes on the right-hand side of the screen here. <laughs> this area shows the lots that are subject to the waiver. The waiver would be to reduce the private open space requirement uh, on the lease lot by lease lot basis. Um, the standard is for 500 square feet of, of, of usable um, open space on the lot with no dimension of that uh, 
open space to be less than 20 feet. In this case, they're simply requesting to reduce that dimension to 10 feet um, because of the smaller uh, lot areas. It does generally match what's seen in the existing neighborhood. Um, you can see here the homes are offset from each other, so um, there's still an opportunity for some privacy and open space around each home. Um, and the resulting building coverages will still meet the code standards, even with that reduction. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry, Trixie. Uh, the next slide shows what I said would be that private, uh, semi-public uh, open space in the, in the form of a development of a playground and recreational facilities. This is the proposed next phase, and this is the area that would be um, developed for that as a condition of this approval in exchange for that reduction, essentially. Moving on to streets and utilities, um, like I mentioned, there's a private loop street internal to the development. City water and sewer are available. Um, the surrounding street network can absorb the estimated additional traffic generated through the development of this next phase. Um, all new lease lots will have sidewalk at back of curb, um, an improvement over what's currently provided in the rest of the development. And they are requesting a waiver to the streets, uh, the private street width here. Um, typically the requirement is for 26 feet width and this would be reduced down to 22 feet, 22 feet in width. That is again comparable with the surrounding existing street network and has been reviewed by our fire department as sufficient. And then lastly, uh, I mentioned some of the previous waivers and variations that are requested. There are several more. Um, there's three more regarding setback uh, reductions. Uh, the first one is a setback uh, along the outer edge of the property. Our current code standards say that if you're developing a brand new manufactured ho housing community, that the rear setbacks along the outer lots has to be quite a, a distance of 30 feet. Um, this existing development does not have that around the rest of its perimeter, perimeter and they're simply requesting to waive the next phase from that standard as well. So to reduce that 30 foot setback down to zero. Um, as I mentioned, um, this parcel to the right of this is a city-owned uh, park area, um, so really it's just impacting uh, the adjacent area that's for, intended primarily for the use of these residents. They're the most, uh, the closest neighbors to this park, um, so it's um, adjacent to them. Also, the lots um, in this phase will eventually be combined with the rest of the development under one plat or one lot, so that outer boundary will actually be reduced somewhat. The other setback is a reduction in side yard setback. The side yard setback is typically required to be five feet. The reduction in this case would be reduced to zero. Again, I mentioned there's some diagonal and offset positioning of the homes that helps to soften that visual impact between units. Um, and then finally, the last one is a reduction in minimum lot size. And the minimum lot size is typically 5,000 square feet. They're asking for a slight reduction down to 4,500 square feet. Um, the reduction in overall lot size does not impact their overall density calculation. They're still well within what's allowed for density. Um, while there are no regulated environmentally sensitive areas on the property, like we've talked about in other applications like stream corridors or wetlands or woodlands or steep slopes perhaps, there are none on this property, but it is within the 100 and 500 year floodplain. And therefore it's subject to additional city regulations in the city's floodplain management ordinance. The city engineer and building inspection staff do review site grading and foundation plans as development occurs to ensure compliance with this ordinance, which does require that manufactured houses be anchored to resist floating, collapse, or lateral movement, and that homes be elevated on a permanent foundation such that the lowest floor of the structure is a minimum of one foot above that 500 year flood hazard height. There was a supplemental memo provided to you in your packet that goes into some further details explaining the federal flood insurance program as well. So as far as development steps, we're here at the rezoning to reestablish the OPD to go along with that existing RS-12 um, high density single family residential designation. There would be a final plat enacted, like I said, to combine some of the previous phases um, and then a site plan and building permits under staff review. So based on a review of the relevant criteria, staff did recommend approval of the proposed rezoning with some conditions. And those conditions include the uh, construction of a storm shelter and a sidewalk along the existing east-west uh, private street all the way out to Riverside Drive. In addition, prior to issuance of building a, pr a permit, the uh, approval of a final plat. And that final plat does contain some additional construction drawings and site graining and drainage information. 
Um, as far as that final plat, uh, there would be a, dis a dissolving of lot lines to essentially create uh, one development here with all of the existing development and this new phase so that, as I mentioned, those outer boundaries are reduced. And the submission of an open uh, space plan for that vacant area to be developed in the future into a playground or equipment or recreational area. And the construction of those improvements to that open space. So at its November 4th meeting by a vote of seven to zero, the Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff's opinion and also recommended approval with these same conditions. Um, the CZA has been signed and I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a few questions, Danielle. Um, on the private open space on each lease lot, uh, did I understand correctly that they are meeting the 500 feet, just not having a single um, side of that be less than 20 feet? Right. It is just the minimum minimum dimension of that area of that open space that's being reduced, not the overall square footage. Okay. And then you talked about the city lot that's immediately adjacent to the east, and they're requesting for a couple of the lots to have zero feet of uh, setback. Right. Okay. So that would mean the structure would be like right on the line with the city property? Right. That um, is correct. And then that's the existing condition along most of the perimeter of this uh, particular manufactured home community, as well as many others that we've looked at. Um, these standards are developed for new development should it occur in the city. However, most of our manufactured housing parks are actually developed at a time when they were not within the city and were under other standards, has since come into the city and are grandfathered and, and much like this. So if it's normal to have a structure right up to the lot line, how does the city handle when people kind of encroach onto the city's property? I imagine that's a, very common. Unfortunately, on a case-by-case -case basis, as it's discovered as a conflict, um, typically, we don't like to see it next to our parks because when it occurs, it makes it difficult for us to maintain our parks. Um, but we, so we do have more eyes on our parks than we would on other private property. But when we find out about it uh, between two other private property owners, it's typically kind of resolved between them. Uh, it's, you know, remove improvements if they've encroached if, if necessary. It, would we consider, or did, did staff consider some kind of easement or something to address some <laughs> buffer area, some ability for there to be essentially that so this would all be you know, presumably new construction. So there would be eyes on the first uh, unit that gets placed on these lots because we would be checking these setbacks at the time of the foundation permit. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of what happens after that, just adding an easement to it just means it encroaches farther and farther and far farther. And <laughs> um, the intention is that that should not occur at all. So unfortunately it does, but I think we would, I don't think there's any way to plan for it to make it less of an impact when it does happen. Could, could we plant, uh, I could see a, you know, a, a landscape screen um, as one way of discouraging any kind of an, you know, encroachment into the park space. Something that would define that edge. Uh, I suppose the, the owner of the community could install a fence around the property edge. That's typically on, on people have to find where yeah. the property is, but even fences get put in the wrong place. Well, I was <laughs> thinking of the city planting trees on yeah. its own property. If, if we it? wanted to plant trees in our park, I suppose we could consider that as an improvement if we thought that would be an improvement for the adjacent properties. I'm not sure. Would we be going in and mowing that regularly? I'm not sure what the maintenance schedule for it is. It's not designated, I don't believe, as a park per se. It has a little bit of a sidewalk in it and, and it is adjacent to the river, so it's a pleasant area, but I don't think it has a lot of other park improvements in it. Okay. If, if I wanted to get to Terry Trueblood, which is kind of off the image, but to the south and a little bit east from here, how do I get there? Um, the applicant will be installing a trail connection from their development to the uh, public sidewalk along McAllister or to this the city-owned land to the east and you would travel east along McAllister on the north side and then eventually cross the street after you cross the river to continue south into the park so so the trail would be where exactly um, I'm not sure if I have a detail on here that makes that clear I'm sure maybe the applicant can point that out when 
So they, in other words, we, I wouldn't have to go all the way up to the road at the top. And no, you would not need to go to Riverside Drive and then around. The intention uh -huh. is to be able to get to it. I, I didn't see it identified on the plan, so I was. It seemed to me to be f fairly easy to make a connection to McAllister. I do have a question about just the the playground. Uh, will that be the responsibility of the of the um, developer, or is that at some point going to be turned over to the city? Oh no, that's private. It would be the developer's responsibility, and it's included in the conditions, the timing of when they need to make those improvements. Okay, and there is no there is no because sometimes we'll have it where it is the developers and then at some point it becomes the city, but that is not a part of this. No, nope. this would be private. Great, thanks. Danielle, could you go to the a picture of the area? I, I'm really not clear on that because uh, there was talk in, in the materials about requiring a storm shelter and where that location would be as well as this park green space play area that they're talking about. Okay, so and the park, the play area, so on the left side of this slide is Riverside Drive, right. and then across the top is the entrance into the community. Right. The orangish square here on the south side of that entrance road would be the area for the future play area for the uh, community. And I'm sorry, what was the second the part? The storm shelter, storm, storm shelter. Storm shelter. Um, I'm not sure if I have, let's see, if any of this details, I think it's on. It's here by the 36. Yep. Okay. Which is on the northwest corner of the next phase, so sort of central to the overall community. And also on that picture, it's a little unclear to me uh, what the plan for parking is for for vehicles. The residents. So you can sort parking. of see in the gray outline the possible footprint of the dwelling and then a pad for parking that's adjacent to each one. It's adjacent to the, the home or in yep, front to of the it? Home. Adjacent to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. No more questions, thank you. Would anyone from the uh, developers like to address this? Good evening, Council. Uh, yeah, here representing Axiom Consultants and the engineer for the project, and I know there's representatives from the coal family and, and uh, the coal manufacturing park as well to answer any of those questions. Uh, just, I think Danielle covered that very well. Uh, just a couple items I'll add on the engineering side of things. We actually do still have a setback shown uh, on that east side between lots 4 and 13 as, I don't know if I can get to the plan here. Oops, nope. Um, on that east side that's uh, between that and the, and the city park that we were talking about. Um, the, the area where there is actually a, a reduction of no setback at all is on that north side, uh, those one through three. Um, and that's because it's all becoming one parcel through that final plat as Danielle discussed. So that's just adjacent to the existing uh, manufactured homes that are already there. So there will still be a little bit of a uh, buffer there in terms of setback uh, as was asked there. Um, we do also show uh, the sidewalk connection, trail connection that you were asking about. It does connect directly to McAllister. It's hard to see. It's on that kind of southwest corner south of number 31 if you see that. And that's got a direct connection to the sidewalk along McAllister Boulevard which would then take you to the trail system. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I think she described it very well. Happy to answer any other questions from the engineering side of things, though. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to open up comments to the public. Welcome. Good evening, once again, Council. Uh, Nicholas Tyson, same situation as before. Not going to dox myself. So. The reason why I came up here, I actually have no feelings one way or the other with regards to whether or not you should vote yes, vote in favor, or vote against this particular proposal. What I do want to remind you all of, though, is, again, the larger context for these things. So in this situation, we have what 
is called a leasehold. So, I mean, this was already explained to you by Danielle. It's a situation where you have a landowner who owns the entire plot of land, and then you have individuals who own the residences, the manufactured homes or mobile homes that sit on top of them. Now, the reason why I remind you of this fact is, one, because the city has an extremely bad history when it comes to dealing well with mobile home residents. Now, I realize that, so I was actually kind of tossing this back and forth, whether to bring this up now or bring it up with regards to the legislative priorities, because it's mentioned there, but it is relevant to this discussion. Now, the reason why I mentioned that specifically, that particular history, and if you are if you don't know what I'm talking about, just the words Foster Road should you know immediately spring to mind. The situation there was one in which a developer had actually created a mobile home lot specifically so as to hold the land for future development and then basically screw over the residents when the time came to make more money by selling it off to somebody else. That is why these mobile homes exist. They exist primarily to hold onto the land because it is leasehold. You don't own the land when you have a home, when you have a manufactured home in one of these lots. And it can be sold out from under the residence literally at any time. That is precisely what happened to the people in Foster Road. And the people who were there, you all went to extraordinary efforts to try and actually arrange a deal. Raphael, who used to work, I mean, Mazahir, you know this. Sorry, Mayor Pro Tem, you know this. Raphael went out of his way to negotiate between the city and the residents there a special dispensation for the residents and the, between the residents and the developer. And the developer screwed them. And you all have done nothing about that. So I am deeply worried because this is in another one of those areas that will be developed into in the future that this is going to be a similar situation, that the developer is just doing this to hold onto the land until such time as they can develop it into something else and screw over the people who live there. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Noah. As you know, I don't dox myself. I uh, just want to second what he said and... Um, yeah, if you're actually going to pass this, have it so you have a provision so you don't screw over more people living in mobile homes. Once again, if you're going, that's an easy thing to do. Once again, it's the easy things you can't seem to do, but you should. And now I'm, this, my next comment is uh, relevant because it's talking about your decision to have accessibility for public comment on this issue. Now you are familiar with their statement, and I'll probably mess it up because, yeah, I'll go through it. Now, I will expand on the need for having Zoom call in public comment at meetings. Every single person should have the same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case. Contacting y'all by email, phone, or talking in person is not the same as giving a public comment at a public meeting, and that is a fact you cannot deny. It is unacceptable and discriminatory and ableist that the very reasonable accommodation of having hybrid meetings is not available for all so-called public meetings, because they're currently not public meetings when they aren't accessible to people. It is an accommodation that the Johnson County Board of Supervisors and Iowa City TRC are currently providing. We are still in a pandemic. Currently, people who cannot safely make it to a meeting are being discriminated against. People should not have to risk death. People should not have to risk death to participate in this so-called democracy like that's an incredibly like low bar that y'all are not even reaching at this point even if we weren't still in a pandemic there are loads of reasons people abled and disabled who for why they cannot physically attend said meetings but would still like to be able to and should be able to have attend those accessible have accessible meetings i'm a disabled person I should be able to participate in public meetings when my disability prevents me from being able to physically make it to meetings. But currently, I cannot do that. This council is currently discriminating against me and the entire disabled community. You are telling me and my community that we matter less than our able-bodied neighbors. So you're going to change the rule or not? Just give Thank me you. thumbs up or thumbs down. Thumb up means you're going to not be ableist. Thumbs down means you're going to be ableist. And no answers meaning you're going to be ableist. Thank you. So why don't we have accessible meetings? Can I have a good reason? I know I can't, but there's no good reason. That was a trick question. If you're done talking on this, I'm item, not please allow talking, the person behind you to come. I still have 10 seconds, 11 seconds. 
nine seconds, eight seconds, seven seconds, five seconds, oh, sorry, five seconds, four seconds. Make your meetings accessible. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. Hi. I'll keep this really short because I know you guys have kind of been dragged through the mud tonight, but um, I'm here. I, I'm Larissa Rosenquist. I'm um, with Cole's community. Um, we need to focus on some common sense here, and that's to vote yes for affordable housing. I think not any, but any of us here could sit here and say we don't need afford affordable housing. Our family has been running parks for many, many years. We're uh, very capable um, in doing so. I just hope that you can all get on board and vote yes for affordable housing. Um, I'm here to take any questions if anybody has any. I, I would just first like to thank you and, and the Cole family for uh, having this plan uh, to increase the number of available lots for manufactured homes in the community because as we all know, especially at one time of uh, manufactured home, manufactured homes were an affordable means for, for people uh, to live in. Uh, they've of course over the years become more and more expensive but they still are affordable. And so I do appreciate uh, the, the, the thought that went into that and, and the plans um, to add these lots. I, I did have just a couple of questions as far as that. Um, I almost hesitate to bring this up, but is it possible that these lots could uh, serve to help replace some of the housing needs of the residents of, of Forest View? Um, you know, that's come up a couple times. Uh, right now we're focusing on just getting this passed. Um, and then we can definitely discuss that. Right now I have half of the waiting list filled up and I feel like I'm gonna make a liar out of myself if this doesn't pass. Um, currently, most of the people on the waiting list are family members from um, current residents. So right. we have a huge need for it. We have um, definitely discussed Forest View tenants, of course. I mean, they're, they're very important to us. It's just, this is a total separate issue and this is, we wanna focus on this right now. Um, and, and but yeah, that's uh, definitely in the, in, in so in regards to that yeah. and, and regards to the waiting list, is, is the plan to for you, you folks to to buy the units and then sell them to the individuals, or will the persons buy them elsewhere and, and then have them placed on these lots? That's a good question. Um, right now we're not in a position to <laughs> buy out all of them at once, obviously. So our current plan is to um, bring them in in about three phases. I think we could do three maybe four phases if we had to um, within a year and a half we'd like to do I know it's ambitious but there's a need for it we, we have a lot of like I've said a thousand times sorry <laughs> um, so we would like to direct them to financial institutions we have a lot of lenders that we've already spoken with um, that's the deal that's the idea um, obviously some people aren't able to do that and we can help in some ways but I wish we could do more. It's just obviously financially, you know, we have to direct them to other institutional lenders. So, okay. thank you. Yeah. I want to point yeah. out before you speak that this um, is a part of the development team. I wish I had, I, I should have invited you up. I just assumed that he was representing, but you can go ahead and uh, speak. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask you about, you said there is some people on the waiting list right now. And uh, what their understanding is, uh, uh, like somebody come and put their name in the waiting list, just not knowing that if they're going to purchase their own home or are they going to bring home to the lot and they can rent only the lot? Or there is no like clear brand? How come you already have, have uh, way people on the I, list and you I'm don't have a clear brand? I'm so glad you asked. Um, I have so many people that I, I've actually put the waiting list on a halt because I don't know if this is going to pass. I hope that it does, but I stopped taking um, people on the waiting list. Right now I have 16 people on the waiting list, and they don't know if they're going to be financing it through us, through a lender. I mean, I've made it pretty clear that to the people I've spoken with that they would have to directly go to a different lender. Okay. Um, so that's I've been very clear in my, I've been very transparent on, on that with my talks with these people. Um, that's about the best way. We have amazing residents. I mean, we just, we're very, very blessed with the people that we have. We have amazing families. Um, so I would, I mean, I would give my shirt off my back for any of them, they're amazing. So um, any way that we can help direct people in the right way, we will. Um, 
right now our plan is to direct them to lenders and hopefully the banks will not charge them a ton of interest rate is what I would like to see. I would like to see local lenders come out and speak to me privately. I mean, my information's right on the sign at the parks. Um, give me a call if anybody has any ideas. Um, also, you spoke about affordability, and do you know like how much gonna be the run uh, the lot rent for now, or you uh, know? Yeah, lot rent raises about ten dollars every year. I mean, that's just kind of on average. It depends if we have um, major improvements. Um, but right now, lot rent's at three eighty. So I would just I always tell people when I sign a new lease, um, just expect it to go up about ten dollars every year. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, anyone else from the development team want to speak before I continue with public comment? Thank you. All right, anyone else like to address this topic from the public? Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to give first consideration? Motion to give first consideration, move. Second. Moved by Sally, seconded by Weiner. Council discussion. Um, I, I would just like to, I mean, obviously, I would like to hear the, um, the we had a concern raised subsequent to the PNZ vote about, about the floodplain issue. I think it's pretty clear in the, in the materials how that gets addressed. Um, I would just like to be clear for the public here and everyone else how how that works i mean i, I and i'm i'm not um the one to explain it so i don't know if maybe if uh, daniel or jeff or someone could could help out but I are think you looking should. for information on the levy that was built the, uh, the levy and then the standard to which it has to be built that it would have that it would have to be infill um just to I think uh, Ron is with me here, so we'll, I'll take a stab at it. Ron, you can jump in if I if I mangle this. But my understanding is that the um, the levy was constructed in response to the 2008 flood by the city in about 2013. It's along the west side of the Iowa River, and it's intended to protect the existing and future uh, housing out there. The levy, when it was built, was not certified by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or accredited by, accredited by FEMA, but it was built to meet both of those organizations' standards. Um, because it's not certified or accredited, it does not impact the FEMA floodplain designation of the area, which is shown on that uh, floodplain f federal flood insurance rate maps or the firms. Um, FEMA accreditation requires an official process uh, that be gone through known as the letter of map revision or LOMAR to um, the flood insurance rate map. If the city revised the flood insurance rate map prior to the area being filled or raised as the applicant intends to do, it would still technically be located within the 100 year floodplain. So that would kind of not be the time to do that. If we were going to pursue a LOMAR to the firm, a letter of map revision to the flood insurance rate map, we should do it after development occurs and something's actually been changed on the site such that the land would be potentially raised out of that flood uh, hazard air area. Um, conducting a letter of map revision is not an inexpensive process. It involves an um, engineering study that we would probably contract out for, and the price estimate that I think we receive from our engineers, that that's probably a six to $7,000 cost to go through a letter of map revision. So staff believes it would be best to complete the development and then consider if we want to pursue a LOMAR at doing so at that point. Want to add anything? So, in re, uh, Ron Kanucky, Public Works Director. So, in regards to the levee design, it was built three foot above the 100 year flood event, uh, which puts it about a foot and a half above the 2008 event down in this area. Uh, the interior drainage, uh, the, the pumps that are there for the, for the pumpage are sized for the 100 year event. Um, so there's there's pipes that will carry the overland flow and then that's pumped into the river. Um, but, but those are sized for a 100 year event interior to the, the drainage area. Mr. Mayor, before we have any further council discussion, I'm wondering if you would be willing to um, gather from uh, council whether they're inclined to vote in accordance with the PNC's recommendation, and if not, we would. I'd ask that you reopen the public hearing. I haven't. Oh. Yeah, you did. I did. You did. Well, uh, are you all inclined to vote in favor? 
Okay. Thank Sorry you, Mr. Mayor. That. Thank you. I just had another floodplain clarification question. Sorry, the, for staff who sat down. Um, but I think from the materials, the intent is to regrade the site that would actually then put it uh, one foot above the 500 year flood point. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. We have that noted on the plan as well for that minimum low opening to be that one foot above, correct. Thank you. And then for staff, if we've got the infrastructure there to deal with the 100-year uh, event and then the site is raised <coughs> up to higher, is that still protective? Is that still helpful? And it also sits on concrete, is that correct, instead of center blocks? Right. So it, in regards to the, it, the, uh, elevating the, the ground, it wouldn't have an impact on how, how, the, you know, how the drainage works within the, the, the areas protected by the levee itself. So with the overland flow, that, that will go to the piping, that will take to the pumps. There, there shouldn't be any issues. Meaning it doesn't, like, defeat the purpose if you elevate the ground, right? Correct. It okay. does, it, exactly. It doesn't defeat the purpose of, of having the levee in place and having the pumps in place. Thank you. And uh, one question regards that too. Then uh, there was concerns raised then of of shunting the water. If there were floodwaters and these are up higher, would the floodwaters then be shunted over towards the lower lying homes? Is that a possibility? No. the the the, the levee itself actually is along the river. So you know, in a, in a flood event, it's the the intent is that the water would stay in the river. It wouldn't actually you know be in the neighborhood. And the area that they're actually building on was actually the area that was was the um, temporary levee during the 2008 event that protected the area and in in, in events after that so there was another event in 2012 or 13 that that basically this area protected the rest of the neighborhood from how many feet were on is the elevation being raised when we get it to that 500 plus one how many feet of fill are we talking about I, I, do you have an idea Brian I, I'd have to double check that. I want to say it's probably three or four feet. I'd have to, don't quote me on that, but and part of that would be both with fill and or, um, as we said, with the slab or elevating the, the manufactured home higher necessarily, you know, as you might see with steps or something like that going into them as well as you mm -hmm. typically would see. So just in terms of elevating that minimum low opening in general. Thank you. Any other discussion by council? Well, I would just say I support this. Um, I, you know, my experience over the years in talking with and dealing with members of the Cole family, if they've done a really nice job and really do care for their tenants, I think all of us, you know, in an ideal world would prefer not to see leasehold kinds of residential areas um, but when you do have that it's incredibly important that you have caring and responsible owners of these mobile home parks and so I, I believe that we have that here I think they've demonstrated that so and we obviously we need uh, more affordable housing so I will definitely be supporting this I'm uh, very familiar with this neighborhood, having lived there for over 20 years at one point in time in my life and actually lived through the flood of 93 that went through there, which was much worse than, than 08. Uh, many of us residents were out of our homes for over six weeks that time. Uh, and that's why I asked about the waters being shunted because uh, it just came from everywhere, the river and the sewers and everywhere. So I do have that concern, but I have driven by there many times and have seen that they have already started to elevate with some fill dirt and, and it looks, uh, it, it's up quite high and I think that's going to make a big difference. Uh, but I just yeah, still have that slight concern, but also concerned about the requests, um, the number of requests for waivers from the standards. That that concerns me a little bit, but there is such a definite need for for these uh, affordable homes. So, I will be voting in favor of it. I also going to be voting in favor of it. But I really want to say that we know that there is many many mobile homes in the area that are not being taken care of as it should be. And I hope this also to continue, like really taking care of the sewers, everything that uh, we've been hearing, like a lot of complaint. I hope 
when we uh, like agree to give this kind of things because as they said, affordable housing is important, but also as the mem said, we, you know, we need like really the owner to be really caring about the resident who live there. You cannot just bring people without giving them services. Uh, even though the, the, the lot is very affordable, uh, but still, they deserve really like good service. Yeah, but I'm gonna vote yes for this. <laughs> All right, roll call, please. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? So move. Second. Moved by Salee, seconded by Weiner. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. We are on item number 11E, rezoning Hickory Trail. This is an ordinance conditionally rezoned in approximately 48.75 acres, a property located south of North Scott Boulevard and west of no North First Avenue. From interim development, single family residential to low density single family residential with a planned development overlay. I'm gonna open the public hearing. And I'm gonna welcome Danielle. Thank you, Mayor. Last one of the night for me. This is the uh, Hickory Trail, formerly Hickory, Hickory Trail Estates, uh, a rezoning shown uh, the location in, outlined here in white, just south of Scott Boulevard and west of First Avenue. Um, this is an application by Nelson Development and is a rezoning as indicated of 48.75 acres. There was a previous application sought for an OPD RS5 rezoning for this development which failed which included a component of single family homes, a senior living facility with 135 bedrooms. Um, the current application has dropped the 41 single family homes, it still includes a senior, senior living facility with 134 bedrooms. Um, and then the remainder of the land, approximately 34, or th sorry, 39 acres, uh, would be uh, considered uh, uh, for dedication to the city for neighborhood open space for the expansion of Hickory Hill Park. This slide shows the current zoning of the surrounding area, including the developments to the west, uh, which includes um, Hickory Heights Lane subdivision, the ACT campus, the Oakdale Senior Living to the north, um, to the east of this uh, property, immediately adjacent to the east is Hickory Point condominiums. And then again, Hickory Hill Park. Um, so in this slide, the green, this is a larger view of that same area, the green would be the area to be uh, combined with Hickory Hill Park. In the southeast corner is the remaining senior living uh, component. And this is a, a blown up image of that same uh, area for a little bit more detail. It's proposed in the same location as the previous application and like I mentioned is approximately or pretty consistently the same number of bedrooms in design. This is an OPD rezoning so you get to see these site plan level details earlier than you typically would. Um, again, um, the only requested waiver for this OPD is the height, which was the same height request uh, that they requested before, which is an increase from the uh, height maximum of 35 feet to uh, 40 feet instead. Um, as we, because this is a OPD rezoning, it does have the additional criteria to go through, uh, as well as the standard ones. The standard ones having to do with compliance with the comprehensive plan. Um, this does preserve natural features um, and it does inc uh, inc connect the sidewalk system along the south edge of the senior living facility to the existing street <coughs> network. And it does provide for a diversity of housing types in that it's providing senior living. Um, as far as uh, the use of the ravine and wetland areas as a buffer along the park boundary, that's also envisioned in the comprehensive plan as well as a cul-de-sac system. Um, the additional special criteria that have to do with over uh, planned development overlays include uh, these criteria, starting with land uses. Senior living development meets the uh, density requirements of our code. The um, design of the uh, project includes essentially a three-story exposure along the northern edge of the development, tapering down to more of a one-story exposure along the public street. Um, landscaping is used to transition between uh, this building's height and the adjacent building to the east of it, which is a two-story building. There's also an extension of the existing street network um, the, uh, to the west, 
uh, for the access to this development and connections, as I mentioned, to the public sidewalks there. Sensitive areas are also identified and protected in this plan. Um, a little bit closer view of the project as proposed. It's about 70,000 square foot footprint. Uh, I'm sorry, height up to 42 feet in height. And as I mentioned, kind of tapering in height across the site. Uh, landscaping again mentioned used to, as that transition. Here's the proposed landscaping at this point. These are details that would be reviewed again at site plan review when the actual development uh, construction plans are proposed. Regarding open space, they are providing the required open space for, uh, as required for the number of units in the senior living complex on site, as well as that very large land dedication for public park expansion. The area in green again is this area that would be uh, included as outlet A for uh, this and, and dedicated to the city for public park. There would be trail connections to the south provided by the applicant um, into Hickory Trail Park as well. Um, Parks and Recreation staff does support the exposed uh, expansion of Hickory Hill Park. Uh, as far as future programming of this area and what improvements might be made there, that's a process that's undergone by the Parks and Recreation Commission and Parks and Recreation staff through their development of master plans. And then funded, of course, through the Capital Improvement Program, which City Council is in control and does review. Um, regarding streets and utilities, um, there are two points of access off the north side of the extension of Hickory Trail Street. Um, as I mentioned, sidewalk ex extensions along that uh, street, including a five foot wide sidewalk along its north side and an eight foot wide sidewalk along its south side. Um, there would be adequate um, city sewer and water surfaces available and we've uh, investigated the impacts to First Avenue traffic um, at the intersection of Hickory Trail and First Avenue, which is sufficient. There are no off-site traffic-related improvements being required with this development. As I mentioned, um, sensitive areas are addressed. There are wetlands, um, both are, all of which are being appropriately buffered, as well as the stream corridors. Um, critical slopes are not being impacted beyond the allowable threshold. Um, and as well, woodlands are minimally being impacted um, well below the, the allowed threshold. As far as steps in the development, we're here at the second rezoning request, the first one which failed in July. This is the uh, revised plan that includes only the senior living, as I mentioned. There would be subsequent steps for planning, site plan development, and uh, building permits eventually. Um, Based on a review of the relevant criteria, staff did recommend approval with the uh, proposed conditions here at its November 4th meeting by a vote of seven to zero. The Planning and Zoning Commission concurred with staff's opinion and also recommended approval of this rezoning with those same conditions. The conditions include uh, the trail connections I mentioned, the sidewalk um, development, also submission of a landscaping plan, uh, detailing any proposed landscaping on lot one, um, basically to be approved by the city forester <coughs> to, uh, allow for that appropriate transition, and then a final plat as well. And that concludes my staff report. I'm happy to answer questions. I have a question about the park dedication um, and reviewing the ordinance and the, and the CZA. Once the land is dedicated to the city, will we be required to only ever use that 39 acres for parkland or is there an opportunity for some other use should a future council see that appropriate? I believe the intention is to dedicate it as parkland which restricts it to the use as a park. Um, it wouldn't be zoned P public use but the, the city would go back through and rezone it to that as well eventually. Thank you. So we know that there was the um, 41 homes at one point that was in the previous proposal. And this is now going to the low density single family residential with a planned development overlay. Can any other development happen um, in this area? So it's the same zoning district as before, but what's the what is different is the OPD gives you a site plan. And if they were to want to build something else, whatever else it might be would have to be 
substantially the same as this site plan that you're seeing. If it's not su substantially the same as this site plan, it's got to go back to Planning and Zoning Commission and be re-reviewed. So while the RS5 zoning might allow other housing uh, by right, the OPD is locking it into this site plan. Okay. And, and that's what I was getting at. Do they have any opportunity there by can, right? There can be some minor changes to an OPD, but they're defined in our code as being very minor. Um, it might be slight changes to the building configuration on the lot, but it would not be something like adding single family homes. That would be substantial. Thank you. All right, thanks. Anyone from the development team want to address anything at this time good evening again Brian Belk axiom um, yeah here to answer any questions uh, related to the the plan uh, also have AG architecture here as well as representatives from Nelson development too that could help answer any questions great good evening Andrew Alden from AG architecture in Wauwatosa Wisconsin um, here um, to talk about the building. It's essentially the same concept that we've presented and you've seen before. Um, we've continued to design a little bit, but pretty much exactly the same except for the height increase. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about that or about the building that you might have. Thank you. Any questions for them? Well, I, <clears throat> I think at the P and Z meeting, there was a like a aerial depiction of the project is that something we could see yes there was a, a video flyover I'm assuming that it is on a server that somebody has access to as I <laughs> wave my hand we don't we don't load that up um, okay. we could certainly uh, look at that for your, the next meeting yeah we it wasn't shown at the PNZ meeting um, I mean it was shown at the PNZ meeting but uh, watching it I could not see it so All right, no questions there. I'm going to invite people from the public to come, whoever would like to talk on this topic. Welcome. Hello. Um, before I have to read this thing, I'm going to ask, are you going to change the rules to have accessible meetings? Seeing no response, I'm going to go again. This is relevant because this is about decision on people being and allowed please to public state comment your name. on this item. Sorry, what was that? Please state your name and address. Uh, Noah, and I don't dox myself, as you know. Um, okay. So, now, I will expand on the need for having Zoom call in public comment at meetings. Every single person should have the same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case. Contacting y'all by email, phone, or in person is not the same as giving public comment at a so-called public meeting, and that is an, an undeniable fact. It is unacceptable, ableist, and discriminatory that the very reasonable accommodation of having hybrid meetings is not currently being met. It is an accommodation that both the Johnson County Board of Supervisors and Iowa City TRC are capable of providing, and are providing, currently. We are still in a pandemic, Currently, people who cannot safely make it to a meeting are being discriminated against. People should not have to risk death. Again, people should not have to risk death. People should not have to risk death. People should not have to risk death to participate in this so-called democracy. Even if we weren't still in a pandemic, there are loads of reasons why people cannot physically attend meetings, yet would still like to be able to attend those meetings, but currently cannot because they're not accessible. I am a disabled person. I should be able to participate in public meetings when my, disability, when my disability prevents me from being able to physically make it to meetings, but currently I cannot do that. This council is currently discriminating against me and the entire disabled community by not having private meetings. You are telling us that we matter less than our able-bodied neighbors by not making your meetings accessible. Also, the last transcripts you can even get for these meetings go back. The, the last time you can, the last transcript available for formal, regular formal meetings is September 27th. That means October 5th. The uh, I can't remember what the other exact date in October is. The other October meeting, the previous November meeting, 
have no transcript available online on your website. And plus, you have to like go digging for the website. They're not linked into the information. Like when you look up city council, you'll find all the information where y'all are and like how where the address is. But you have to like go searching in the website to even find the transcripts. And there's almost two months backed up of not having any transcripts. Excuse me. There's, I was wrong on that. The last meeting there was the work session transcript, trans, transcript. But that was just the work session. But there's no other work sessions except for that Thank September you. meeting. Welcome. Hello. Good evening. My name is Jason Napoli. Um, I am a neighbor of the Hickory Trail Development, and I also serve as vice chair of the Friends of Hickory Hill Park. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, Mayor and Council, um, Jeff, and all your city staff who have worked on this uh, for the past year or so, uh, as well as the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, we uh, greatly appreciate your time, talent, and patience. So another uh, party I'd like to thank is the, uh, the members of the community who have spent a lot of time uh, working uh, together and uh, in individually on uh, you know, talking about this uh, proposal for the last uh, for the past year. This, this started uh, with a previous um, design uh, with a good neighbor meeting back in December of 2020. And uh, here we are after two good neighbor meetings, four planning and zoning meetings, and now this is the fourth city council meeting uh, related to this, uh, this property. Uh, as for the current proposal, uh, this is a design uh, the Friends of uh, Hickory Hill Park do support uh, in good faith of uh, the parkland being deeded to the city and uh, becoming a part of Hickory Hill Park. Um, you know, we do appreciate the developers' um, ecological and community mindedness of the proposal and also the need of uh, assisted living and uh, memory care uh, in, the, in the local area. It's been very clear from planning and zoning uh, as well as uh, council uh, for the previous proposal that it's needed and that we fully support that uh, uh, with the use of the building uh, and the land. Um, adding the 39 acres to Hickory Hill Park is an incredible opportunity and a responsibility that the Friends of Hickory Hill Park will take very seriously. Uh, we would be more than happy and uh, committed to partnering uh, with the city on uh, just like we do the other 185 acres uh, currently existing. Um, this includes uh, maintaining the trail system, uh, advancing native prairie restoration, as well as working tirelessly on invasive species removal. So again, just want to thank um, everyone who has had a part in this. And uh, again, we do support the proposal, provided it goes through with the deeded parkland uh, as proposed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? All right, Council, are you all inclined to support this? Yeah. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to give first consideration? Move. Second. Moved by Sally, seconded by Weiner. Council discussion? I just really like the cooperation now between the presidents and the developer and they come up with this great plan and thank you for the developer for donating this land to the city for extending the park. That's really like, appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, Happy this is going that way, and we'll, lie, we'll vote for it, yes. As uh, uh, the member of the public mentioned, it, it has been, it seems like a very long process, uh, but with a lot of community involvement, and I think that's why we are where we are today with this, and, <clears throat> and it is assuring to uh, hear from the friends of Hickory Hill Park that uh, they do support this version. Uh, so that that's a very positive uh, aspect and I will support it for that reason but I, I would encourage the developers to um, uh, try to assure us that you'll consider sustainability uh, there's a pretty large building footprint with this uh, the size of this building and um, sometimes it seems like we take two steps forward on our climate action plan and fall four steps backwards when we have built bit large building projects so um, try to minimize uh, any overall impacts on, on the environment um, with this, and we'd appreciate that. I'll support this. I've always supported this part of the project. I, um, I am disappointed that we did not pass the other one. Um, 
went through three P and Z, two city council came to the third city council and then votes changed and, and didn't pass it. And again, it gave, you know, we lost an opportunity for more housing in the city. Um, I think a lot of the discussion from council focused on affordable housing, which is not what we're supposed to be looking at when we're looking at rezoning. Um, I know there was also issues about cul-de-sac versus through street, et cetera. But you know, when you take this and you take the lack of annexing Carson Farm and then you try and talk about affordable housing, we don't have a lot of land left to develop in this city and we need to continue to grow. And the only way we're gonna you know, get some progress on the affordable housing is to build more. And I realize this wasn't going to be, it would probably be high-end homes, but you also get people moving from less expensive homes into the higher and then they make room for people coming into those lower end homes. It was, it was also, I found really disconcerting during that time to hear people or have them writing us letters about how we were developing Hickory Hill Park. And I mean, I reached out to some of them, where are you getting this? I mean, we're adding, even at that time, we were adding 14 plus acres to Hickory Hill Park and people were being fed misinformation that we were actually developing the park. Um, so yes, I will support this, but again, I am disappointed that we lost that opportunity to add 41 houses to our housing stock. I'll have an even um, more unpopular opinion. First, I do want to say thank you to everyone for all their work. And I think this is a, a kind of shockingly good outcome, um, given how I foresaw it may have, have ended. Um, I will be supporting this. However, the reason I asked about the dedication of the land to the city is that uh, we know that infill development is some of the most um, helpful thing that we can do as far as our climate action and we know that we have a really significant housing shortage in the city and we know that the city owning property is one way that we can actually create permanent affordable housing and so i'm actually a little disappointed that we aren't able to go that route and i understand that the developer wants it to be locked in as parkland and i understand the advocates for uh friends of hickory hill request that as well but um i, I do see that as a bit of a missed opportunity here well, I, I can remember when, and this has been a very long, long process, almost a year in length with lots of meetings, um, <clears throat> mentioning when we were meeting with the Planning and Zoning Commission about the notion of, of developing a plan uh, which was more with an emphasis on designing with nature. And uh, I think this plan, you know, has achieved that. Uh, you know, what I learned through, through this process was how cherished Hickory Hill Park is to the community. It's an extremely important um, element within the community that has been dramatically strengthened by this project. Um, the, you know, that east, that east front of the park was always a concern and, um, you know, I, I was, I was not expecting uh, the way this thing played out. I, I did feel there were development opportunities off of Scott Boulevard, but I can understand, um, you know, the thinking behind just essentially uh, leaving the, the single family or residential development off the table. But what we have here is certainly, you know, when I look at Iowa City over the long term, which I think is something we often um, get so wrapped up in the issues we face on a day-to-day -day basis that we forget to think about the long term. In the long term, this is a huge win for Iowa City. And, um, you know, I'm really, really thankful that, uh, you know, we, we ended up with this outcome. So this is one that, um, I have to agree, I was a little surprised that uh, there was a more um, in what we will be seeing. Um, but I'm very pleased with the outcome and for many reasons. One is um, we know that the community came out, which we often get the community <laughs> to come out when it's their neighbor, <laughs> right? Uh, and And I think for this particular one, um, I do believe that um, we have to somewhat envision um, the long term, as it was mentioned. 
And this city is going to grow. Um, we're going we're gonna to expand. Um, and I think sometimes we forget that, you know, these infills that, you know, we can pack up this entire city um, with housing, you know, in the infill. And certainly there is a great need for housing and even a greater need, greater need for affordable housing. Um, what I will say is I'm really uh, um, happy to see that um, there is unification <laughs> today on this item, um, not only from um, this council on this, but also from the developers as well as from the neighboring community. Um, and Hickory Hill, uh, Hickory Trail is definitely, the, the entire area over there is pretty, pretty important uh, part of this community. And I'll be happy to support this tonight. Roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item number 12, access control upgrade. Resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the access control upgrade project. Establish an amount of bid security to accompany each bid. Directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm going to open up the public hearing. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Ron Kanucky, Public Works Director. Uh, the project before you is upgrade of access control for three of our facilities uh, at our water plant, our city hall, and at our wastewater plant. Uh, currently, uh, we have uh, card access within City Hall. Uh, this will update the, the, the system that's there, uh, bring it in line with um, an overall master plan uh, for access. Uh, at the water plant, we have current access there. It's a two-card system there, so they're actually going to bring that on and have it be just off of one system. And then at our wastewater plant, we don't have uh, card access yet. It's all still physical keys. Um, this project's estimated $155,000. Uh, the project would start in January and be completed in April. Any questions? Thank you, Ron. Thank you. All right. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Welcome. Hello, my name is Noah. Now, before I go on this again, are you going to change the rule? Or decision, whatever term it is. You know what I mean. Okay, this relates to this because it is about the lack of accessibility for public comment on this item. All right. Now, I'll expand on the need for having Zoom call in public comment at all meetings. Every single person should have the same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case. Contacting y'all by email, phone, or talking in person is not the same as giving a public comment at a public meeting. That's an undisputable fact. It is unacceptable and discriminatory that the very reasonable accommodation of having hybrid meetings is not currently happening for this council. It is an accommodation that Johnson County Board of Supervisors and Iowa City, TRC, and many school boards across the state are having hybrid meetings. We are still in a pandemic. Currently, people who cannot safely make it to a meeting are being discriminated against. People should not have to risk death to participate in this so-called democracy. Even if we weren't still in pandemic, there are a lot of reasons people cannot <coughs> physically attend meetings, but should still have that ability, should still have the ability to attend meetings hybridly. I am a disabled person. I should not, I should be able, sorry, I should be able to participate in public meetings when my disability prevents me from being able to physically make it to meetings, but currently I can't do that. This council is currently discriminating against me and the entire disabled community. You are telling me in my community that we matter less than my able-bodied neighbors do. Thank you. I, I, I'm ready to add, I'll answer questions since y'all will answer questions for other people. So any questions? No, thank you. Are you going to make them accessible? No. Thank that, that, you. You could do that right now. 
by saying you're going to obviously it's too late for this meeting but for future meetings you could say right now we're going to have accessible meetings in the future thank you would anyone else like to address this topic i never saw the time clock go on okay seeing no one i'm going to close and i'm going to close the public hearing motion to give approve please so moved thomas <clears throat> second Moved by Thomas, seconded by Salee. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item 13, Highway 1 Water Main Replacement. This is a resolution approving the project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the Highway 1 water main replacement project, establishing amount of bid security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders, and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing. And welcome. Joe Welter, a senior engineer with the Engineering Division Public Works. This project is located on the north side of Highway 1 from Hawk Ridge Drive to the Westport Plaza, which is the Walmart entrance. Uh, you can kind of see the layout there uh, shadowing the existing trail. This is replacing approximately 1,600 feet of water main. The existing water main is 1990 vintage. It's a high pressure transmission line. Uh, so when it breaks, it causes a lot of pressure loss uh, in the surrounding system. There have been seven such breaks since 1990 on this line. Many of those caused by uh, very corrosive soils that are in this area. So for this project, we'll be using a PVC pipe instead of a ductile iron pipe, which uh, will help uh, resist those corrosive soils. We are going to use trenchless installation to min minimize the disturbances. There'll be uh, very few disturbances to the trail, uh, the actual trail. There will need to be a detour route, um, and unfortunately because of where this is located, all the roads adjacent to it all lead to Benton Street, so the uh, detour is going to go from Sunset to Benton to Miller. We are going to try to have local accommodations when work is not happening uh, in, in the form of some temporary gravel surfaces along the areas that are going to be excavated. So that should help uh, mitigate some of that um, long pedestrian detour. This is an interesting water main project because it has no water services along it. So. Uh, that's not usually typical for us. We usually would have some residents or businesses or other properties that would have water services along the lines that we're replacing. This one does not have that. Uh, the bid opening is uh, later in December uh, with a start date in March, substantial completion, which is at the end of the seating deadline in the spring, and then final completion 30 days later at the end of June. Uh, the estimated cost is $460,000. Uh, Watersmith Engineering designed this. They did an excellent job. They've done several projects for us in the last couple of years. There's my contact information for anybody that would have questions. So this is going to affect access on the trail, not on the roadway. Is that correct? Correct. There is no need for a vehicular. Okay. Um, there will be a couple of times when we're getting equipment on and off of the project site where they'll have to close down one lane of the highway, but it'll be, okay. it'll be uh, for short durations, not even a whole day, a okay. um, couple hours. Uh, so we, we, we're seeking uh, permission from the DOT for those closures, but the detour is for pedestrians. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Would anyone from the public like to address this topic? Hello, my name is Noah. 
Welcome. All right. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Is this about? Oh, I'm sorry. That wasn't Welcome. very. Hello. I'm going to start it over again. All is this right. about Anyone Highway 1, public Water like Main? To this topic? No. As you can hear in that video, one of you is mothering <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, that really, like, it just shows how little you care about accessibility. Is this related yes, to it Highway is because 1? It is about or the accessibility problem of being public comment on this item. So it is actually. So, once again, let me read my statement and then you can say Jesus Christ again. Which, for the record, Jesus Christ would be appalled by your behavior if you're like into that stuff or not. All right. Now, I will expand on the need for having Zoom call in public comment at meetings. Every single person should have the same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case, as you know. Contacting y'all by email, phone, or in person out of a meeting is not the same as giving public comment at a public meeting. That is a fact. It is unacceptable, ableist, and discriminatory that you are not providing the very reasonable accommodation of having hybrid meetings. So you can call them public meetings. The Johnson County Board of Supervisors and Iowa City TRC both have hybrid meetings. We are still in a pandemic. Currently, people who cannot safely make it to a meeting are being discriminated against. People should not have to risk death to participate in the so-called democracy. Even if we weren't slam pandemic, there are a lot of reasons people cannot physically attend meetings, but would, just, but would still like to and should be able to attend meetings. I am a disabled person. I should be able to participate in public meetings when my disability prevents me from being able to physically make it to said meetings. But currently, I can't do that. This council is currently discriminating against me and the entire disabled community. You are telling me and the entire disabled community that we matter less than our able-bodied neighbors do by not allowing us the same opportunity that you give able-bodied people to attend these meetings. It doesn't even just affect disabled people, able-bodied people still have plenty of reasons of why they can't physically attend these meetings. You are silencing your public and that is completely immoral and you should be ashamed of yourselves and change that now. There's no reason not to. No, sorry, no good reason not to. There's a reason to, but it's a terrible one. Thank you. It's a shameful one, actually. And like, search into your heart, as you like to say, and stop doing that. Stop being ableist, stop discriminating, and actually like, listen to the people. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Saying no one. I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So move, Taylor. Second, Burgess. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item number 14, Muscatine Avenue, American Legion Road, speed limit. Ordinance amending Title IX, Entitled Motor Vehicles and Traffic. Chapter 3, Entitled Rules of the Road. Section 6, Entitled Speed Restrictions. Subsection B, Entitled Exceptions. To modify the 35 miles per hour speed zone for American Legion Road and Muscatine Avenue. Staff is requesting expedited action. I move that the rule requiring that ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived and the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second. All right. Anyone from the public would like to address this topic? If so, please come forth. Welcome. Hello, my name is Noah. This is round who really is counting and this pertains to this item because it's about the accessibility issue of not letting people publicly comment on this item on said agenda. So here's the statement once again. Now I will expand on the need for having Zoom call in public comment at meetings. Every single person should have the same opportunity for public comment as everyone else. Currently, that is not the case. <clears throat> 
Contacting y'all by email, phone, or in person is not the same as giving a public comment at a public meeting. That is a fact. It is unacceptable, ableist, and discriminatory. The very reasonable combination of having hybrid meetings is not currently available for these so-called public meetings. This is an accommodation that both the Johnson County Board of Supervisors and Iowa City TRC are providing. Two examples of, entity, of yeah, entities uh, in this county that are currently having hybrid meetings. We are still in a pandemic. Currently, people who cannot safely make it to meetings are being discriminated against. People should not have to risk death to participate in this so-called democracy. Even if we weren't still in a pandemic, there are a lot of reasons for why people cannot physically attend meetings, but should still be able to attend those meetings. I am a disabled person. I should be able to participate in public meetings when my disability prevents me from being physically able to make it to said meetings. But currently, I can't do that because this council is discriminating against me and the entire disabled community by not making your meetings hybrid and accessible. You are telling us that we matter less to you than our able-bodied neighbors do. Now, why is that? Why, why, are you, why are you telling us that? Like, what? You want to like put it in words? Why you view us as less? Like, don't you like work for for your day job with disabled people, and this is how you treat them? Bruce, I'm talking to you, by the way. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Uh, yes, I would like to keep dressing since my time's not done. Make your meetings accessible. Thank you. And I'm not done talking. Accessible meetings, accessible meetings, let's have accessible meetings. Yeah, 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 accessible meetings, accessible meetings. It's not hard, y'all can do it. Other entities in this same county are doing it. You're purposely choosing not to because you are very ableist. Stop being ableist. That's a really easy ask. That shouldn't be hard to do. Do it. Don't just sit there silently, y'all. Janice? Now I just wanted to, to let you know in case you were not aware that we put it on the work session topics tonight. I'm sorry, what was that? I just wanted to make sure you're aware that, it, that, that I asked this evening at the work session that it be put on our work session topics so we can deal with it. Oh, you asked that, but it wasn't actually put on it, right? It was, there was, there was enough support was. to put it on the work session topics. So when would that be? Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion passed to 7 to 0. Can I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved. moved. Second. Moved by Weiner, seconded by Salee. All in favor say, oh, sorry. Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item number 15, City of Iowa City, 2022 State Legislative Priorities. Resolution establishing the City of Iowa City's 2022 State Legislative Priorities. And I am going to, hello, Rachel. But hello. before that, could I get a motion uh, to approve? <laughs> Don't move. Second. Moved by Salee, seconded by Weiner, and welcome, Rachel. Good evening, Marin City Council. Rachel Kilberg, City Manager's Office. So as you know, the City Council traditionally adopts um, a, a set of state legislative priorities prior to the start of each legislative session. Um, the 2022 session starts on January 10th of 2022. And as a reminder, the Iowa legislature operates on a two-year calendar. The 2022 session will be uh, the second year of the biennium. This means that any bills that passed um, final deadlines last session and remained alive at the end of the session uh, will remain alive at this upcoming session. So knowing this, the legislative priorities uh, in front of you tonight are largely consistent with what you approved last year, um, and those do align with your strategic plan. I will just call out two notable additions um, made in, in these 22 priorities. First, we are advocating for the state to modernize municipal bonding laws, um, specifically to catch up those bonding limits to inflation, as well as to modify the essential corporate purpose 
definition in order to include public safety facilities, um, some general public works functions, trails, and then improvements to any facilities that were previously approved by the voters. Uh, the second addition is that we included support for um, improving access to affordable, high care, quali high quality child care through the implementation of the recommendations from the governor's child care task force and also to invest in uh, training and incentives for child care workers and providers. So adopted state legislative priorities are shared with our local delegation and we have again retained uh, Carney and Appleby to provide lobbying services for us in 2022. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Welcome. Uh, good evening once again, Council. Um, so I was reading the legislative priorities last night, and I, I have to say I don't generally have any criticism. Well, no, I do have a criticism. The criticism relates to the absence in this list. So, for instance, I at least listen to every single meeting that this council holds. And I have heard you utter the words, affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing, ad nauseum. The word affordable house, sorry, the phrase, affordable housing appears nowhere in this document. Which is interesting because on a number of occasions, I've heard this very council talk about the various state impediments to implementations of things like public housing. Just an example off the top of my head. So one of the reasons why I and others have specifically advocated for public housing in the past has to do with the fact that you have to kind of get around the state's incredibly bizarre rent control laws. Rent control is only possible in this state if you build public housing. It's the only, it's the only exception in the law. So that seems to me like an area that you would actually want to advocate for. If you're really interested in bringing housing costs down in the city for the vast majority of residents, I hear a lot in these conversations about the need to build more houses and your bizarre trickle-down theory of housing, which, by the way, <laughs> Michael Hench, when this was being, when, sorry, the Hickory Trail issue was being, I realize this is a separate topic, but it is germane to this discussion. It was a member of the PNZ committee made exactly the same argument that Councillor Mims made with regards to trickle down housing and then immediately contradicted himself because he realized it didn't make any sense. It explained why it didn't make any sense. So I would suggest going back and reading the PNZ minutes because it's all right there. But the thing is, there are a number of issues on the, at the state level that this city could be advocating for to deal with housing, to deal with your supposed grand interest in affordable housing. And yet, it's not there in this document. I mean, I have said many, many, many times that this city, this council, is not actually serious about housing. You pretty much approve things willy-nilly all of the time. You say you care about it, you say you want to do something, but when it comes to putting paved to the road, you don't. And this document, which literally contains your own legislative priorities, is a very clear indicator of that fact. I mean, I realize it's too late to amend it now, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Right. Hello, my name is Noah. I'm not going to read my statement again, as you should be familiar with it by now, and you finally spoke up after the 10th time I said it. So I'm not entirely sure exactly what I'll ask you after the meeting about that, but so regardless, that's why I'm not reading it again because of that after 10th time. Now, uh, for legislative priorities, like you said, you talk about affordable housing all the time, but you can't put it on your legislative agenda. That's bizarre, just bizarre. <laughs> um, and secondly, uh, you should have on there to uh, like repeal, repeal the black to blue bill, which I realize that's not gonna happen because we live in a, a state house controlled by the fascist party, so. I guess that's kind of not going to happen, but like you could still put that on there to get rid of that trash law. But this doesn't say anything about defunding. You could you could still defund the police. You like the law says nothing about that. Talk you can't like 
decriminalize weed, but you could still, there's no like language in that law about defunding. That's why the Johnson County Board of Supervisors went ahead with their GPS tracking program because they misunderstood the law at first and they realized, oh wait, the law doesn't actually say that. That's all. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing no one, council discussion. I was grateful to see the continued emphasis on um, trying to protect and strengthen home rule. I think we know that the limitations on um, the occupancy and things that we've tried to do to stabilize neighborhoods and help with affordable housing, especially in the core neighborhoods that were overturned by the legislature relate to our, the reduction in local control. Similarly, with our affordable housing policy and our annexation, um, you know, that's, uh, we can do that because we have the authority to do that. So grateful to see that that's included. So I appreciate the child care piece being included. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the task force plan put out by the governor is not sufficient. It deals with sort of the business side of things and the building. It does not deal with actually increasing the wages and the training to, to be able to provide the workforce, which is what's missing from it. So, I mean, I hope that, that not just our city, our city, but others around the state, since everybody's affected by that, will continue to lobby on that. I think in conjunction with that, I, I, what I would like to see, what my dream is to see a facility actually, uh, perhaps in conjunction with uh, Kirkwood and their child care education program uh, that would not only provide child care in that building, but also educating individuals uh, to go out into the community to, to provide mu the much needed care. And whatever we can get from the state to help us do that would be great. I just know our local um, representatives that will be there um, will have some challenges, but uh, hopefully some of the ones that we have selected will be able to get some movement, if not movement, some discussion, continued discussion. Here are no other comments. Roll call, please. Weiner? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 16 is council appointments. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. And this is a 16A, Library Board of Trustees. Library Board of Trustees, one vacant city fill an unexpired term upon appointment through June 30th, 2023. And this is time for council discussion. I mean, this, this takes on, to me anyway, some added, added importance given all the <coughs> discussion, not just around this state, but in other states about pulling books, banning books, and so forth, that really puts a focus on the importance of, of this library board. Um. It was, again, it was good to see so many applicants uh, for this particular board, uh, all with uh, good experience and quite an age range. Um, I, I had two that stood out for me. Is it now is time? Can I mention those two? Okay. Uh, I thought Claire Matthews, she has uh, actually has a master's in library science, and. Uh, Anna Turncliffe uh, said she has a lot of experience with libraries, so I would uh, go with either one of those. And this is a non requirement, either either or, male or female. The other, um, I, we do have a number of librarians on the board already, which is great. The other person I found very interesting is is Erin Nelson. Um, a teacher, mm -hmm. an international mm -hmm. experience professor. Mm -hmm strategic planning, certified sustainability practitioner, planner, and so forth. And I just, I thought that she had the potential to uh, make contributions. I think we have a number of good applicants. I'll just throw into the mix. Um, Pamela. Borgelay. Yeah. Borgelay. Mm -hmm. Borgelay, I think. Thank you. <laughs> um, especially to Janice, your comments about the, the concerns of what the library may be facing. She had good, extensive experience in some DEI 
um, activities. It says a lot about the quality of the applicants when we don't start out with much of any consensus. <laughs> yeah, I agree with every name that was, you know, it's a lot of good applicants. I, for some reason, Claire Matthews um, resonated with me. So I'll, I'll second Claire if no one else has. We have a second for Claire Matthews. Any others with seconds? I will support Clara Matthews. It's fine. Yeah, I will. I think they're all strong. It's fine. On, on Clara, I also like the fact that she's got that she's she's directly dealing with high school students all the time as well, so she understands that piece of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we have a majority. So could I get a motion to appoint Clara Matthews to the Library Board of Trustees? So moved. Second. Well, Second. by Taylor, seconded by Weiner. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed to seven to zero. <clears throat> Item number 17, announcements of vacancies previous. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. Housing and Community Development Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Senior Center Commission, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, December 28, 2021. Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Airport Zoning Commission, Iowa City Representative, one vacancy to fill a six-year term. Board of Appeals Building Design Professional, one vacancy to fill a five-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, East College Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term. Senior Center Commission, one vacancy to fill a three-year term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. And we are at item number 18, um, USG, welcome. Hi, Council. Um, I just, I'm gonna keep it short. I sent you an email just now with all the announcements, so I'm just gonna skim through them. But also I wanna say that USG is in support of the Excluded Workers Fund as well as a Zoom option for Council. Um, Ellie and I are conducting a survey about Homeless Week um, and students' experience with Homeless Week in Iowa City, so I'm gonna send you all a link to that. Um, feel free to take it. We want community members to take it as well. Um, Janice has been helpful with that initiative, um, so it's been cool. Um, our Justice and Equity Committee is conducting a menstrual equity survey right now. Um, I'm also gonna include, include that in the, meet, uh, in the email, and there are also, um, conducting a gender neutral bathroom audit um, and looking to get funds to distribute like more menstrual products on campus in general, so that's really cool. Um, the Daily Iowan is having a legislative forum um, with representatives of Johnson County tomorrow at the public library, there's a link for that. And then the airport shuttle is happening for students for winter break um, after finals as well. So thank you. Great. All right, number 19, City Council information. Uh, all right, um, I did want to thank Mayor Pro Tem for filling in last meeting for me. I saw it all, and I really appreciate you stepping in. I tried. <laughs> Item number 20 is a report from our city staff. Or we'll start with our city manager. Nothing tonight, Mayor. Thank you. And then our city attorney. Nothing. Thank you. Our city clerk. No. All right. Number 21. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I'll give it moved by Salise, seconded by Taylor. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Have a good evening, everyone.